This story is called The Howl and a Gruesome Discovery from Silver Pensmith. Let's begin. This happened to me on August 12, 2016. It was an overcast afternoon when I arrived home from work. My wife, Leanne, had been online searching for the perfect dinner recipe when she told me about an article she stumbled upon. It detailed a series of vicious attacks that had taken place in our town of Redwood Heights. Leanne seemed concerned, but I reassured her that we lived in a relatively safe neighborhood and there was nothing to worry about. But the following week, the news made no mention of any capture or progress in the investigation. The following Saturday, my best friend Lucas arranged a small get-together at his home just a few blocks away from mine. Leanne insisted on staying home, telling me that she'd had enough nerve-wracking experiences for one week and preferred to immerse herself in the comfort of our living room. As I kissed her goodbye and left our house, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. At Lucas' house, we were having a good time chatting and joking around. As I was laughing at one of his stories that never failed to crack us up, my phone vibrated with an unexpected call from my neighbor Tom. Hey, do you have a second? I just heard some weird howling coming from your yard, Tom said nervously. I hesitated for a moment but dismissed it as an overly cautious neighbor reacting to some stray animal noises. I thanked him and assured him that everything was probably fine. However, as the night went on and more drinks were poured, my concern grew heavier with each passing moment. By the time we were saying our goodbyes around midnight, I could hardly conceal my mounting dread. Anxiety gnawed at me as every worst-case scenario played in my head on the way home. Upon reaching my house, a deep chill coursed through me when I noticed the back door wide open. I sprinted inside to find the most gruesome sight I had ever encountered, our beloved family pet, a sweet Labrador named Gus, lay lifeless and mangled on the kitchen floor. I called out for Leanne, my heart pounding harder with each echo unanswered. Running up the stairs in a blind panic, I found her huddled under our bed, quivering with fear. She couldn't form words, but her tearful eyes pointed to the window, as if to implicate something outside. Fighting back rage and dismay, we called the police. They were disturbed by what we described and decided to station a patrol car around our home until further notice. We stayed at a hotel that night, unable to face the reality of the horror that befell our once safe haven. Days turned into weeks with no respite from fear. At work, my focus was lost as morbid thoughts consumed me throughout the day. Late one night, on my way home from the office, rank guttural sounds filled the air around me. A newfound awareness sent shivers down my spine. It was unmistakably close. I reached home and found Leanne sitting on our bed, her face pale and scared. As I tried to console her, I noticed deep claw marks on the walls and furniture of our house. We couldn't make any sense of it, but we knew that something sinister was happening in Redwood Heights. The next day, instead of going to work, I decided to inform my boss about our emergency and take the day off. Leanne didn't want to stay at home after what happened, so we went to a nearby cafe to discuss what we should do next. We had a long conversation about whether we should call the police again or try to seek help from friends or family. But in the end, we realized that involving others might put them in danger too, so we resolved to face this problem ourselves. Since contacting friends or family was not an option, we started searching online for information about Redwood Heights' history and any incidents that might have been relevant to our situation. We discovered many articles about mysterious disappearances throughout the years, 
specifically during full moons. Leanne insisted on speaking with Tom, our neighbor, who had called me about the howling noises the night Gus was killed. When she explained everything to him, including our recent findings, Tom suggested that everyone in the neighborhood should be informed and stay indoors during full moon nights. Over the next few weeks, more eerie occurrences haunted our town. People reported hearing strange sounds during the night, and several more pets were found dead in their backyards, each torn apart just like Gus. Frustrated by the lack of answers and feeling hopeless as the body count grew higher, Leanne and I decided that it was time to leave Redwood Heights for good. As we started packing our belongings on a cloudy day, just before another full moon night was predicted, there was a knock on our door. Lucas stood outside with tears filling his eyes. He spoke in a shaky voice. Leanne, you won't believe what I saw last night. Tom, our neighbor, was the one who killed your dog. I saw him transform into a werewolf. We stared at him, struggling to comprehend what he said. If Tom was the werewolf responsible for the attacks, then nobody in Redwood Heights was safe anymore. But as we recalled the claw marks inside our house and the horrors that had followed us ever since that fateful day when we first read about the attacks online, we began to realize that maybe there wasn't just one werewolf in Redwood Heights. Perhaps there were more of them hiding in plain sight all along. This story is called The Werewolf's Sorrowful Serenade, from Arcturian Scribe. Let's begin. This happened to me in 2002, on October 19th. That fateful evening, my friend Jim Kolovich and I were planning an impromptu board game night at my place. We needed snacks for the night, so around 7 p.m., we decided to walk to the corner store not too far from my house. Our small town in Vermont had always felt safe and quiet. No one ever thought twice about strolling around after dark. As we approached the store, we noticed that our usually busy street had become eerily still. Out of nowhere, we heard a bone-chilling scream from somewhere in the distance. Jim and I exchanged concerned glances but cautiously continued toward the store keeping our ears peeled for any further sounds. We made it to our destination without further incident and began browsing the store's offerings. Just as we were debating between two flavors of chips, we heard another scream, louder this time and much closer. Startled, Jim dropped the bag of chips he was holding. Did you hear that? he asked nervously. Yeah, I replied. We should call the police and tell them what we heard. But our cell phones weren't getting reception inside the store, a rare occurrence in town. As fear coursed through us, we decided not to leave until someone could tell us that everything was okay outside. The shop owner didn't mind us staying, so we sat down near the storefront window to keep watch. An hour ticked by without incident so I finally mustered up the courage to step outside with Jim close behind me. Just as I opened the door, another chilling cry emanated from a nearby alleyway, accompanied by a faint scratching noise. Jim clenched my arm tightly as our eyes darted around. My palms were sweating and my heart was pounding as the eerie scratching noises persisted. We listened carefully, and then decided to cautiously approach the alleyway where we thought the sounds were coming from. As we crept closer, we discovered a horrific sight, a mutilated human body, ripped to shreds and partially devoured. Trying not to lose our minds with terror yet needing to help, we dialed 911 and breathlessly reported the gruesome discovery. The dispatcher told us to remain outside the alley until officers arrived. 
With each passing minute seeming like an eternity, sirens finally pierced the night. The police arrived and questioned us extensively about what we had seen and heard. Just as they were finishing their initial inquiry, one of the officers cried out an exclamation of horror. We turned around to find that all that was left of the mutilated body was a bloody trail leading into the darkness. Incomprehensible panic surged through everyone present. The police ordered us back into the store for safety and began canvassing the area with weapons drawn. Jim and I watched with throbbing hearts through the store window as officers methodically searched every nook and cranny. Suddenly, a gut-wrenching howl pierced the air, this one different from before. It didn't sound human but more like an animal's tortured cry. The hair on my neck stood on end as I realized it must belong to our unseen assailant. We watched in shock as several officers sprinted toward a new scene. A fellow officer sprawled in agony on the ground with deep gashes in his leg. Their tension was palpable through our window. Whatever had caused this chaos wasn't an ordinary criminal, but something far more terrifying. The police rushed their injured colleague to safety and urged everyone in sight to stay indoors while they continued their search for this malevolent perpetrator. Jim and I traded shocked glances before resolving not to leave until daylight broke. Little did we know, the nightmare was far from over. As the hours crept by, sporadic screams came from different parts of town. Jim and I remained glued to our vantage point in the store, taking turns dozing off between adrenaline-fueled bouts of horror. All the while, I couldn't help but wonder if family and friends we knew outside our haven were bearing witness to similar atrocities. Sunlight finally peeked through the gloom and, with it, created an illusion of safety. Officers had rushed off to investigate another incident elsewhere in town, and crushed under exhaustion's weight, we decided to slip away and head back home. Jim and I made our way back home carefully as daylight now flooded the sleepy town. We were both horrified by the events that took place throughout the night, not wanting to speak about them just yet. The streets had never felt so unsafe. At home, we barricaded the doors and windows as a precaution while tuning into the local news for any information. The reports spoke of several attacks and deaths around town, yet no suspect or motive was found. The unknown perpetrator remained at large. Days went by with more incidents of gruesome attacks being reported, always under the cover of darkness. We couldn't understand why none of the victims called for help. Perhaps they too felt paralyzed by fear or didn't know whom to trust. The local authorities desperately tried to put together a plan to catch this vicious attacker, but to no avail. People started preparing for the worst, stocking up on supplies, and even arming themselves. It was clear that everyone feared for their lives. One evening, Jim and I decided that we couldn't live like this any longer. We gathered our phones, flashlights, and weapons before heading out into the night. Our goal was not to confront this killer but to find others who may need help or safety in numbers. We maneuvered through dark alleys, cautious with each step and listening intently for any sounds around us. Suddenly, we heard footsteps approaching fast from behind us. As we turned around, prepared to face whatever it was, we saw our neighbor Susan in a state of terror. She gasped for air as she reached us. My husband! Something attacked him! He's badly hurt! Without wasting time, Jim replied, Take us there. Susan led us back to her house where we found her husband on the floor in their living room. His body was mangled with deep gashes across his chest and legs. He was alive but barely conscious. 
I quickly dialed 911 while Jim attempted to apply pressure to the husband's wounds. The ambulance arrived shortly after, carefully loading him onto a stretcher before tending to Susan. As she held her wounded husband's hand tightly in her own, tears streaming down her face, I realized that the pain of losing loved ones was unbearable. As days turned into weeks, tensions continued to rise in our town. Despite numerous searches and investigations, the identity of the attacker remained a mystery. The night of the full moon came, and we decided to stay indoors, hoping for the best. However, fate had other plans. Hearing a commotion outside our home, I peered through a window only to see a mass of fur and teeth moving swiftly through the darkness. It was gigantic and fast, unlike any animal we'd seen before. We knew that we couldn't outrun it or fight it off. Our only option was to hold up inside and wait until sunrise before venturing out again. The windows shuddered with every eerie cry it emitted while wandering around outside our home. The tension was unbearable as we silently prayed that it would just move on. At last, dawn broke with an eerie calmness washing over us. We carefully surveyed the damage outside our home, seeing claw marks in the soil and broken branches scattered across our lawn. The beast had been so close, yet ultimately eluded us all this time. As we looked around at the carnage left behind by this relentless creature's rampage, one terrifying revelation struck me. Werewolves were real? All this time, we thought it was just a crazed human or some wild animal on a killing spree when confronted with its true nature as a vengeful werewolf stalking our quiet town. With this newfound knowledge, uncertainty and fear seeped into every corner of our lives. We were living in constant dread of when this nightmare creature would strike again, knowing now just how terrifyingly powerful it was. It was an undeniably pleasant and mild October afternoon when I found myself in Yellowstone National Park, taking part in my company's annual hiking retreat. I had recently joined the company as a marketing intern, and this retreat was the perfect opportunity for me to get acquainted with my colleagues. Feeling a tinge of anxiousness, I felt grateful that they insisted on starting rookie hikers like myself off with an easy, breezy trail. As we trekked along the path, one of my co-workers, Melissa, told me stories about their past hiking escapades. She also teased our boss about his horrendous snoring, which could be heard across the entire campsite. Our laughter pierced through the crisp air, as we reached a clearing where we stopped for a quick lunch break. Breathing in the fresh forest scent, I couldn't help but smile in amusement at my co-workers bickering over who would control their evening campfire playlist. Gradually resuming our hike, we were only a half hour away from our campsite when Melissa slipped on some loose gravel and twisted her ankle, swearing in pain. Quickly assessing the situation, our supervisor decided to take charge and radio for help while the rest of us cautiously continued to assist Melissa. Meanwhile, dusk began to descend on us like an ominous blanket. As we stumbled along the dim trail, we detected an odd noise echoing from deeper parts of the forest. It seemed to be some sort of gnarled growl or raspy breathing. Uneasy glances were exchanged among us. It wasn't uncommon to encounter wildlife in Yellowstone, but this particular sound triggered chills down our spines. Our supervisor reassuringly spoke up. It must be just a passing bear or wolf searching for food, he said dismissively. But I couldn't shake the ominous feeling forming within me as we progressed further into dusk. 
It all began escalating when we heard another unsettling sound, one of branches snapping and heavy footsteps running towards us with alarming speed. My pulse sped up, and my heart pounded in my ears as we picked up our pace, moving as fast as we could without further injuring Melissa. The sound persisted for a few minutes, the running creature coming to a sudden halt just far enough away to leave it hidden in the shadows. By this point, even our supervisor had an expression of concern as he began barking orders at us to move faster. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone or something was stalking us from the shadows of the forest. Finally, the darkness arrived in its totality and snaring us within its ominous grasp. As we neared our campsite, for a fleeting moment, terror took hold of me when I caught sight of something staring back at us from a distance. The grisly figure stood erect on two legs, seemingly towering over eight feet tall. It held in one of its hands what looked like a mangled corpse, with blood dripping onto the forest floor. With elongated limbs and a snarl revealing menacingly sharp teeth, it appeared like a horrific hybrid between man and wolf, something straight out of a twisted nightmare. Our supervisor grabbed his hunting pistol just as it began bounding towards us again, unleashing an ear-splitting roar that shook our spirits to their core. Pulling the trigger, he aimed for any vital point on its massive body he could find. But even that didn't seem to stop this hellish creature from advancing upon us. In that harrowing moment, our supervisor shouted, Everyone, get to the camp. I'll hold it off as long as possible. We obeyed, carrying Melissa with haste towards the safety of the campsite while he bravely faced the nightmarish creature, firing his pistol in an attempt to halt its advance. Upon reaching the campsite, we worked together to improvise a makeshift stretcher for Melissa and hastily erected a protective barrier using any available materials, logs, rocks, and remaining camping equipment. Continuous gunshots echoed from where our supervisor fought. Tensions rose. We anxiously awaited his return or any further instructions through our radios. Time seemed to stretch indefinitely. The gunfire ceased abruptly, leaving an eerie silence over the campsite. Our radios crackled to life just as we were starting to lose hope. Panting heavily, our supervisor's voice came through. I managed to wound it. It's retreated for now. But I don't know if it'll return. You all need to stay alert. We took turns keeping watch for any signs of the monster while awaiting help from Melissa. As daylight made its slow ascent over Yellowstone's horizon, we saw a rescue team approach our campsite. They quickly attended to Melissa and informed our supervisor that park rangers had been contacted about the creature's sighting. Before departure, the rescuers shared with us tales of a wretched creature passed down by locals called Dogman, a half-man, half-wolf monstrosity believed to reside within Yellowstone's woods. While many thought of it merely as folklore or legend, recent encounter testimonies started circulating in hushed whispers amongst park rangers. That unsettling name stirred churning dread within me. I felt nauseous at what we had faced. As the rescue team escorted us out of Yellowstone Park and towards medical aid for Melissa, thoughts of what could have happened to us if our supervisor hadn't been armed or able to repel the creature were impossible to shake. The hair-raising reality that something so monstrous, something straight out of local legends, had been stalking and attacking us remained mind-boggling. Over the following weeks, whispers of our encounter with the dogmen circulated within the company. Some dismissed it as mere exaggeration or tall tales, but those of us present could only share knowing glances and hollow, forced smiles. We knew what we had seen and heard. 
Right in the heart of Yellowstone's lush forests lurked a terrifying mystery that we couldn't even begin to comprehend. That's when the park rangers decided to restrict access to certain areas where sightings were reported, urging visitors and staff alike to report any strange occurrences they might experience. With each passing day, the gruesome memory of that night faded slightly, though it clung stubbornly to the dark corners of our subconscious. Melissa's recovery was slow but steady. She bore not only physical scars on her ankle but emotional ones too from our nightmarish encounter. Our supervisor maintained close contact with park rangers for news regarding dogmen, but there always seemed to be scarce information and vague rumors, nothing concrete enough for closure. To this day, we still can't explain how a mythic creature like dogmen could possibly exist or what its true intentions were. But we know one thing for certain, those who tread within Yellowstone Park cannot disregard the unsettling feeling that they're being watched by something sinister hidden in the shadows, an undeniable sense that even in daylight, terror stalks unseen within those ancient woods. This story is called The Werewolf's Gruesome Deeds, from Profound Puzzler. Let's begin. This happened to me on August 13, 2010. By all accounts, I was living a completely normal life in the beautiful and tree-lined town of Ashmont, California. With a good job and friends, I was known for my light-hearted humor and occasionally entertaining family gatherings at home. Well, that life changed for me after one perturbing incident. It was an evening like any other when I received an urgent phone call from my friend, Josh McKenzie. His voice was barely recognizable, consuming fear radiating across the line. Hey, I just got home from work, and there's something really messed up in my living room. He stammered. What happened? I asked cautiously. I can't even look at it. Please, just come over. His panic tone piqued my curiosity and concern, so I rushed to his house. The moment I stepped foot inside, the smell hit me like a wall, a damp, rotting stench that made my eyes water. In the middle of Josh's living room lay the mangled remains of what seemed to be an intruder attack. Furniture was ripped to shreds, Crimson stains splattered across the walls, with no visible victim. My heart raced as I barely muttered out some jokes to lighten the atmosphere. Geez, Josh, having another party without inviting us? We shared nervous chuckles but knew we couldn't brush it off as a joke this time. We decided against calling the police since there wasn't a body or any solid evidence of what actually transpired in his living room. Instead, we called our friends Sarah Thompson and Emilio Gomez for support. The following day, after work, we gathered at Josh's place, equipped with cleaning supplies, ready to eradicate any traces of the unknown incident. Things went downhill from there, Spending more time in that living room somehow made us all feel uneasy, as if we were being watched. We began sharing strange experiences that occurred the night after Josh's call, faint growling noises outside windows, peculiar scratches on car doors, and an unsettling premonition that something was lurking nearby. That morning, another misfortune occurred. Sarah called and reported the remains of a person sprawled across her backyard, limbs grotesquely mangled. We rushed over immediately, our hearts pounding with fear and trepidation. Horrified upon examining the morbid scene, none of us could understand what entity could have caused this level of carnage. 
We silently agreed to not involve the authorities out of equal parts fear and an eerie feeling that they wouldn't be able to help us. As days passed, we found ourselves unable to relax. Our once friendly town was now plagued by a menacing presence, one that haunted our thoughts and dreams. Surviving each night became our singular focus, our jovial personalities gone with no trace of humor left among us. Our group reconvened at Josh's house one evening to discuss our terrifying predicament. Suddenly, Emilio shouted out from behind the kitchen window, Guys! There's something outside! We all gathered nervously by the window. There, in the dim moonlight, stood a massive, hairy beast, its bloodshot eyes staring right back at us. It let out an indescribable guttural noise that pierced through our ears. For a moment, time froze, and all we could do was gaze in terror at this monstrous behemoth. The creature lunged towards Emilio's car, its powerful arms effortlessly tearing into the metal exterior as a show of force. Without missing a beat, I reacted quickly, grabbing my shotgun and firing multiple rounds at it from inside the house. The shots briefly deterred the creature, causing it to retreat into the darkness of the night. In that split second, we knew what we were up against, a werewolf or something akin to it. We decided to take matters into our own hands or face continued torment from this ghastly beast. Rushing out of Josh's house, we prepared ourselves for an intense confrontation that we knew may very well be our last. Time had run out. It was now or never. We knew we had to do something. We gathered at Josh's house to formulate a plan, a way to protect ourselves and stop this beast once and for all. Emilio suggested we fortify our homes with silver, recalling legends of silver being effective against werewolves. But there wasn't enough time or resources to do so. Instead, we agreed that sticking together and forming a neighborhood watch would be our best bet. We divided ourselves into groups, taking turns patrolling the streets at night. None of us felt entirely comfortable facing the creature alone. Every night was filled with tension and unease but it seemed as if our presence deterred the beast from making another attack. Just as we started to regain some semblance of normalcy, Sarah made a horrifying discovery while on patrol. Over here, she called out in a hushed tone. Making our way towards her, what we saw sent chills through our bodies. It was the lifeless body of a neighbor, gruesomely torn apart. The sight was stomach-turning. However, we couldn't afford to panic now. We had to act fast. The group reasoned not to call the police because none of us believed an officer would last long against this monster. Instead, we turned to each other for support and tightened our patrols even more. As the days went by, our lives revolved around guarding the neighborhood and searching for signs of the beast's presence. While trudging through the woods near Josh's house during one patrol, I stumbled upon something that left me breathless, an underground hideout filled with bones and torn clothing. Knowing I had found its lair, I ran back to tell the others about my discovery. We agreed that destroying its home could be our chance at forcing it out of town, or at least hinder its ability to attack us further. Each armed with makeshift weapons, we ventured down into the beast's abode. With every clank of a bone on the cave floor and every snap of a twig underfoot, we held our breath. Our presence within its domain was not only symbolic but also dangerous in itself. The tension held us tightly as we moved deeper into the lair, finding a nest of torn fabric and fur and the scent of rot filling our noses. We set fire to its home, hoping it would be enough to chase it away or weaken it. As we watched the flames consume the lair, a deep, 
bellowing sound echoed throughout the woods. The creature was coming for us. As we scrambled back towards town, we heard deafening howls behind us. We split up once we reached safety, struggling to catch our breaths as we raced into our houses to seek shelter. It wasn't long before one of us saw a massive silhouette prowling through the streets. We gathered inside Josh's house, grateful to still be alive but terrified of what lay ahead. Sarah stared out the window with fear in her eyes while Emilio loaded any remaining ammunition he had, determined not to go down without a fight. What if this creature doesn't leave? What if it just keeps coming back? Sarah whispered in dread. It wasn't until Sarah mentioned how she found peculiar tracks leading to and from the town elder's home that a realization dawned upon me. Our antagonist wasn't an unfamiliar monster that stumbled upon our town but a werewolf who had been living among us all along. This story is called Werewolf in the Willows, from Nightcrawler 77. Let's begin. This happened to me on July 28th. 2004. I was walking home from my late night shift at the diner where I work. Little did I know that this seemingly ordinary night would change my life forever. As I left work, I met up with my co-worker and best friend, Kyla Hamilton. We began our routine chat about the day's events and how mundane and dull our lives had become. We took our usual route through a deserted park, which was often shrouded in darkness by tall willow trees. As we reached the center of the park, we decided to sit beneath one of these trees to continue our conversation and to share a cigarette. Kyla lit the cigarette and took a long drag. You ever wonder if there's more out there, Jack? She asked me with a teasing smile. I mean beyond these willow trees. I chuckled and replied, Well, you know me too well, Kyla. But sometimes I do wonder what's beyond this town. Little did we know that soon we would have an answer to that question, an answer that neither of us wanted. Suddenly, we heard something shifting in the grass nearby. We froze in fear as the sound grew louder and drew closer to us. Emerging from between two bushes was something large and gruesome, a bloody human limb lying lifelessly on the ground. Kyla let out a shaky scream as she stumbled backward, dropping her cigarette. What in holy hell is going on? She yelled at me in terror. I couldn't find my voice. Terror had rendered me speechless as I tried to make sense of what was happening. We were suddenly confronted by the reality that something sinister was lurking around us, something neither of us had ever encountered before. Together, we cautiously approached the gruesome discovery, as if drawn by a macabre curiosity. The limb appeared to have been severed from its body by something incredibly sharp and powerful. The air was thick with dread as we examined our finds, each of us practically holding our breath. Out of nowhere, an eerie, blood-curdling howl echoed through the park, sending shivers down our spines. Kyla grabbed my arm in fear, her eyes wide with terror. Jack, let's get out of here. Something isn't right. She practically hissed the words at me. I couldn't agree more. We fled back towards the entrance of the park our hearts pounding in our chests. As we ran, I glanced behind us, expecting to see some beast or maniac chasing down its prey, but there was nothing in sight. Moments later, we reached the main street and stopped to catch our breath. Kyla was nearly hyperventilating as she clung to me, her eyes darting around in a panic. We have to call the police. She said between gasps for air, and all I could do was nod in agreement. 
I pulled out my phone to dial 911 when another chilling howl sounded off through the trees. Instinctively, I looked towards the park entrance, and I could hardly believe what met my gaze. At the park entrance, a large, hulking creature stood on two legs, its silhouette illuminated by the faint glow of a distant street light. It was covered in thick, matted fur and appeared to have long, sharp claws on both hands. Kyla and I exchanged horrified glances. It seemed that our worst fears were being confirmed. We can't call the police now, Kyla whispered urgently. That thing will be gone by the time they arrive. I knew she was right. What's more, it was clear that we needed to get as far away from this monstrous beast as possible if we wanted any chance of surviving the night. We decided to head for a nearby convenience store, from where we could alert others to the imminent danger and also seek shelter. As we rushed down the street, we couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching us. We glanced back occasionally but saw no trace of the creature. Our every step felt heavy with dread, and the unsettling howls continued to haunt us in our flight. At last, we reached the convenience store and quickly explained our situation to the frightened cashier on duty. He begrudgingly allowed us to use his phone to call 911. His reluctance was understandable considering there was a good chance he'd also become a target of this terrifying creature. While waiting for the police to arrive, Kyla and I huddled together near one of the store windows that faced out towards the park. The howling sound continued sporadically, chilling us to our very core. When several squad cars finally pulled up outside, we hesitated briefly before leaving the safety of the store. We realized that actually facing whatever monster was behind these grisly murders would likely be more terrifying than any howling sound or sight of dismembered limbs. The police officers informed us that they had found multiple bodies in varying states of mutilation throughout their search of the park. Our blood ran cold at the realization that our horrifying discovery earlier that night had not been an isolated incident. As we provided the officers with a detailed description of our encounter, they called for backup, and more reinforcements arrived on the scene. Soon enough, a large-scale search operation was underway, with police officers and even members of various wildlife services scouring the area in an attempt to capture the monstrous creature that had been stalking us just moments earlier. Several hours passed with no sign of the creature. The sun was beginning to rise when suddenly, one of the search teams radioed in that they had spotted the source of those chilling howls. Tension filled the air as we approached the location. There, amidst the copse of trees on the outskirts of a playground, we glimpsed the astonishing truth behind these gruesome attacks. It wasn't a maniac or some other kind of unknown animal that had terrorized our town. It was a werewolf. In that moment, we glimpsed its true form. It stood over another victim, facial features twisted in a snarl and crimson-stained fur catching in the early morning light. The shocking revelation left us all wondering just how long it had been living amongst us in silence. Faced with this unimaginable nightmare, Kyla and I were left speechless and forced to grapple with our harrowing experience as well as the trauma we'd endured that fateful night. Willows Park became forever haunted by the werewolf's heinous axe, now ingrained within its ghostly branches and blood-soaked paths. It was a hot August afternoon in Anytown, USA, and I had just moved from a small town into my new apartment after landing a job at a local marketing firm. It was my second day in the city, and I decided to explore the local park before meeting up with my friend Miles, 
who would guide me through the city later on. I'd put on my sneakers and grabbed a bottle of water before heading out. The park was only a few blocks away, and as I entered, I noticed an eerie silence that seemed off to me. This quietness made me long for the buzz of cicadas in my hometown. On my way, I encountered some passers-by who warned me about bizarre recent sightings in the park. Laughing it off, I continued on my way. Strolling down the path, I came across a peculiar sight. Some broken tree branches littered on the ground near what looked like an abandoned campfire. A few feet away from the branches, there were long scratches in the dirt. Something about this made me feel uneasy, but being an outdoor enthusiast with experience camping and hiking in different environments, I dismissed it as an animal encounter. As the day progressed, I couldn't shake off that uneasy feeling from earlier, despite having spent some time enjoying the sights and sounds of nature. Walking through muddy terrain now, I spotted muddy footprints, but they were strange, too large for an ordinary dog and elongated as if distorted by mud or whatever had left them. I decided to call Miles and ask if he had heard about this situation in the park. He told me that locals were calling it the Howler. Some believed it was a large dog or wolf roaming around at night while others believed it to be something more sinister, like a werewolf or a twisted human-animal hybrid creature. Not one to scare easily and quite skeptical of such stories myself, we agreed to meet up later to check out The Howler, together, even though part of me hoped it was just a wild rumor. Satisfied that I had seen enough of the park, I trudged along the muddy path toward the exit, eager to reconvene with Miles and share some light-hearted sarcasm about this small-town myth. Just as we were jesting and laughing after comparing our beliefs and deflections, I abruptly froze, for through the trees I glimpsed a disfigured figure looming at us. It was shrouded by foliage, but I could discern an abnormal shape that instantly wiped the smile off my face. All humor now deflated, we cautiously ventured forth, attempting to dismiss our newly formed dread. Within moments of stepping closer, a guttural growl the likes of which either Miles nor I had ever heard before reverberated around us. My heart rate skyrocketed beyond any sensible measure as we hesitated in our tracks. Miles, I whispered hoarsely feeling foolish for conjuring up all those silly possibilities earlier. I think we should leave. Now, before Miles could reply to my trembling suggestion, that horrific noise intensified as a menacing creature emerged from the shadows ahead of us. Rooted to the spot, we beheld the origin of that chilling sound, an abominable being with distorted canine features atop a twisted humanoid frame, an incarnate beast that spurred terror within us as it bared its grotesque teeth. The creature snarled, drool dripping from its gnarled fangs, and without warning, it charged at us. Miles and I reacted on instinct, splitting up and diving out of the creature's path. The beast stumbled slightly but quickly regained its footing and tried to go after Miles first. I scrambled to my feet and yelled, trying to distract the monster. The howler turned its attention towards me, snorting with rage and lunged. I was barely able to dodge its enormous claws, which tore through the air with frightening speed. The creature relentlessly pursued me as I sprinted between trees and hopped over fallen logs. It was nimble on its feet despite its size, keeping up with me at every turn. In a desperate attempt to escape, I attempted to climb a tree when the creature was momentarily delayed by tripping over a root. With my heart pounding in my ears, I scrambled up the trunk and reached the sturdier branches. However, 
The howler grabbed onto the base of the tree and started shaking it furiously, intending to bring me crashing down. Meanwhile, Miles had managed to loop around us unnoticed in all the chaos. Quietly approaching from behind and carrying a large rock that he must have found nearby, he struck the beast over its grotesque head with all his strength. The animal yelped in pain and disorientation before collapsing in an unconscious heap on the ground. Not wasting any time, Miles helped me down from the tree before we bolted towards the park entrance. We knew we couldn't kill the creature, if it was even possible, so our next best option was to get far away from it. Following our close call with whatever monster had haunted these woods, we promised each other not to speak of this incident again. It took only two days for curiosity to get the better of me, though. As terrified as I had been during that encounter, I needed answers to explain the existence of such a ghastly beast. I took it upon myself to research possible explanations. It led me down a twisted path of urban legends and mythology fit for a horror movie. It wasn't until I spoke with Mrs. Caldwell, an elderly woman who lived her entire life in any town, that a semblance of clarity emerged. She listened intently as I hesitantly recounted our terrifying encounter with the howler. Her expression grew grave as she recognized its description. Child, she whispered in a trembling voice. You encountered the rabid one, created by dark forces many years ago. She went on to explain that it was responsible for numerous deaths and injuries around any town, though few believed her tale anymore. As cryptic as Mrs. Caldwell's words were, they provided at least some explanation for that horrifying creature. Miles and I swore never to return to that part of the park, avoiding any chance of crossing paths with the rabid one again. However, the nightmares persisted. Horrifying images of bloody claws and gnashing teeth would jolt me awake late into the night. The bodies of victims discovered mutilated reinforced our fears. We knew better than to try relieving our guilt by warning people about what lurked in those woods. How can someone ever live peacefully knowing such evil exists? But perhaps that's a burden we are simply fated to bear. After all, we have looked evil directly in the eye and survived. Meanwhile, the rabid one disappeared back into the shadows of the park on a new moon night plotting when it would next terrorize any town, lurking just beyond reach and comprehension. It was a Wednesday night when I had to swing by my part-time job at the local diner to grab my paycheck. A week ago, on September 15th, I would have never imagined the horror that awaited me, but the beginning of this tale starts quite harmlessly. I can still remember laughing at my co-worker Kayla as she flipped pancakes onto her head in a bizarre twist on the classic diner, Flair. The thermometer was dancing around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and there was still a slight chill in the air as summer reluctantly released its grip on our small Connecticut town. While walking back from picking up my paycheck, something stirred in the corner of my eye. I looked around, scanning the once familiar streets that had started to seem different. After a few unsettling minutes of comforting myself that it was just my imagination, not unusual after hearing a witty joke, my path led me to an underpass I'd traveled through a thousand times before. As I began heading into that dim area beneath the train tracks, my footsteps echoed through the silence. But this time, something felt different. The stagnant air weighed heavy with an impending sense of doom that rattled me to my core. Just as I reached the midpoint under the underpass, 
an ungodly screen tore through the area like thunder. I wasn't sure if it came from behind or in front of me. I felt disoriented and horrified by the thought of who or what could be emitting such a blood-curdling sound. Despite not wanting to glance anywhere but ahead, curiosity finally overcame fear, and I turned around cautiously. There it was, a seven-foot-tall abomination covered in matted fur that glistened with moisture like roadkill brought unnaturally back to life. The wretched thing lumbered forward on its vaguely human limbs, claws tipping its darkened fingers, glinting menacingly beneath flickering streetlights. Just as I felt the weight of true terror pressing down on my chest, a familiar voice called out from behind me. It was Kayla, her panic yells pulling me back to reality as she sprinted toward me. Run, damn it, she shouted, her voice wavering but determined. We bolted through the underpass, hearing the sounds of heavy footsteps right on our heels. Never before had I been so terrified or pushed my body to its limits as much as that night. The thing seemed to be everywhere, shifting and lunging within our peripheral vision. By some miracle, or some twisted cosmic joke, we managed to escape into a nearby alleyway, narrowly avoiding its vicious swipes. In a moment of clarity and courage, I found a sharp shard of broken glass on the edge of a dumpster. As the beast closed in, I threw it with all my might at its face. There was a horrible hiss that seemed to shake the ground beneath our feet. In pain and rage, the creature reared up one final time and then vanished into the shadows as quickly as it had emerged. My heart slammed in my throat like a jackhammer as we shared a moment of panic-stricken shock before comforting each other in stunned relief. And so here we are, said Kayla, gasping for breath between her words. Her eyes darted around, reflecting our chaotic thoughts about everything that had happened in those terror-filled moments. The sense of imminent danger lingered like an invisible fog around us thick and stifling. I gripped her hand tightly as another howl echoed in the distance, a distorted reminder that we were far from safe. We exchanged weary nods and began hustling again towards safety, though we couldn't truly see where we were headed or what lay ahead. With my heart pounding, Kayla and I continued to make our way through the dimly lit streets. We desperately needed help, but calling the police seemed too risky. They might not believe us, and even if they did, who knew if they could handle this vicious creature? Instead, we decided to head to the local library, hoping to find answers about this monstrous antagonist. As we entered the library, we moved quickly, scanning the shelves for anything related to local legends or mythology. Both of us knew that time was of the essence. The creature could find us at any moment. I found a dusty old book tucked away in the corner titled, Cryptids and Legends of Connecticut. With trembling hands, I opened it and began flipping through the pages. There it was, a detailed drawing of the beast we had encountered. It resembled a werewolf-like creature but with longer claws and more vicious eyes. The name beneath it sent shivers down my spine, Narbeth. The text described Narbeth as a vengeful spirit born from ancient rituals performed in the deep woods centuries ago. It mentioned that Narbeth could only be seen by those it deemed worthy of its torment. Knowing how dangerous it was to confront Narbeth directly, we devised a plan. We'd gather materials around town to build a makeshift cage and lure Narbeth into it using a recording of its own haunting howls as bait. Then, we'd lock it securely inside before seeking help from an expert on such creatures. For the next couple of days, Kayla and I managed to carry out our plan with considerable effort, avoiding any further encounters with Narbeth by staying out of its hunting grounds. 
We knew very well that every minute mattered and that one wrong move could lead us straight back into its deadly grasp. The cage was finally ready, and every detail had been meticulously planned to ensure that nothing would go wrong. Even though we had no experience dealing with such powerful creatures, there was something about taking matters into our own hands and devising a plan that felt empowering. Nevertheless, as we prepared to set our trap, fear not at the back of our minds. What if we didn't capture Narbeth? What if it was free? We were treading on dangerous territory, but there was no other option. We set the recordings in the cage, pressed play, and waited. The air grew tense as we waited for the eerie, demented screeches of Narbeth. Suddenly, we heard it. The drawing from the book did not do justice to the menacing creature that emerged from the shadows. Its fangs were stained red with blood, and its eyes seemed to glow with a malignant fury. But despite our fear, Kayla and I stood our ground. Somehow, our plan worked. Narbeth took the bait and stepped inside our makeshift cage. As soon as it crossed the threshold, we slammed the door shut and locked it tightly. The creature howled in rage and frustration, but it was trapped. Our hearts beat heavily in our chests despite the relief of capturing Narbeth. We knew there was still much work to be done, finding an expert who could help us permanently rid our town of this nightmare. For now, though, we have stopped its rampage. With an incredibly well-thought-out plan behind us and an uncertain future looming ahead, Kayla and I stared at each other through the dim light of dusk as if seeing each other for the first time in days. It wasn't over yet, but for now, we had succeeded in trapping Narbeth within that cage. And perhaps more importantly, we had kept hope alive throughout this harrowing adventure, a hope that one day soon... We could rid our town of this terrible darkness once and for all. This story is called Footprints of the Ruthless, from Regulus the Abhorred. Let's begin. This happened to me on August 19, 2005. Life had been ordinary even boring for me. I was just a simple guy named Leonard Simmons, living in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and working as an accountant. My days consisted of numbers and reports, and in the evenings, well, not much changed at home. However, that day was different. While walking to my office building after lunch break with a colleague named Roger Howell, we took a detour through a small park close to our workplace. I'll never forget the scene we stumbled upon. A magnificent oak tree had been brutally mutilated and stripped of its bark. The sight was revolting. Deep claw marks dug into the heartwood, and sap oozed all around. It was evident that this wasn't the result of human actions or even natural causes. What do you think could have done that? Roger asked nervously. I don't know, I answered quietly. A heavy sense of unease washed over us as we surveyed the disgusting sight of it all. The worst part was that bark fragments strewn across the grass bore faint traces of blood alongside markings unlike any animal we could identify. Later that day at work, Strange circumstances plagued my thoughts even more than usual spreadsheets were able to distract from. There were localized power outages throughout Allentown disrupting computers and freezing colleagues mid-sentence. Doors wouldn't open or shut correctly around the office building, despite no visible obstructions or issues with their mechanics. After days of strange happenings both at work and on my walk home, Odd screeches in the distance at dusk and mutilated branches littering footpaths. I gathered enough courage to share my concerns with my roommate, Greg Thompson. Leonard, 
Greg said gravely after discussing the situation. I've noticed it too. I wake up in the middle of the night feeling like we're being watched. Do you think we're in danger? Despite his frayed nerves, Greg tried to lighten up our conversation by cracking jokes toward the end. Ever the optimist and supportive friend that he was with an unmatched sense of humor. It lifted our spirits, if only fleetingly. We began to notice a pattern. The strange occurrences always centered around one location, a bar called the Rusty Bull near our apartment building. Things were becoming intense, and people were getting hurt. Ink-black handprints stained both the indoor and outdoor walls of neighboring buildings, which only fueled my curiosity and anxiety. Finally fed up with having to hide every aspect of my life inside my apartment and aimlessly investigate bizarre events when faced outside, I decided it was time for confrontation along with Greg and Roger. As we stood outside the rusty bull one evening, prepared for whatever was about to face us, a horrifying growl echoed through the air. Panic-stricken eyes shared glances as whatever had been causing this carnage approached us. To our surprise, though, instead of a grotesque creature from nightmares lunging out of shadows or an overly ambitious hardcore prankster in costume admitting defeat, all went quiet around us until nearby dozens of gravely disoriented people tumbled out one by one from various exit points around the building in a rush for fresh air. During the chaos, I managed to catch a glimpse of something terrifying. Massive footprints marked the ground that led straight into the rusty bull, prints whose physical attributes weren't remotely human or animal alike. Gathering ourselves together once again despite still quaking limbs, those present decided to find answers on their own terms. We waited until the full moon's night before aggressively confronting our fears head-on. On that fateful night of August 27, 2005, we walked into the bar, a place that seemed to be the epicenter of all things unexplained and dreadful. The room fell deadly quiet as we took our seats, and we waited. The door swung open with a loud bang, and the unmistakable growl filled our ears again. There it was, the source of all our terror, an enormous werewolf standing just outside the bar's entrance. It stared directly at us with piercing yellow eyes, its instincts wildly going haywire. The werewolf lunged toward us, its claws slashing the air with fury. We scrambled back in terror, knocking over chairs and spilling drinks as we tried to avoid its brutal attack. Despite our best efforts to call for help, the sheer panic that rendered cell phones useless in shaky hands made quick work against success. Leonard, get behind the counter! Greg shouted as he grabbed a pool cue and attempted to fend off the monstrous creature. Roger followed suit, grabbing a chair to use as an improvised weapon. I dove behind the counter and frantically searched for anything useful. As the struggle continued, it became increasingly clear that our attempts to fight off the werewolf were futile. It swiped Greg aside sending him crashing into the wall with a sickening thud. Roger was next, his chair's shield reduced to splinters by the beast's powerful strikes. He fell to the ground, clutching his injured arm with a pained grimace. I felt powerless at witnessing my friend's assault firsthand, but soon I came across a sealed liquor bottle among scattered debris on my end. With my heart pounding out of my chest and my palms tense on the glass, I clutched it tightly and charged forward from a safe hiding spot. With as much force as I could muster, I swung this makeshift weapon at the werewolf. Its heavy impact combined with highly flammable alcohol content bursting upon contact ultimately scared it off more reliably than we could have hoped for within desperate seconds. Werewolf stumbled back in surprise and sudden pain as liquid fire danced across matted fur. 
growls and roars of anger bellowed louder than before while fearsome beasts beat hastily retreat from bar premises. Together, we watched in apprehension when flames began to subside from the werewolf's body, its sheer willpower allowing it to escape from what could have been grave injury or even death. As Roger supported still dazed Greg, who was fighting unconsciousness, we hesitantly stepped forward to survey the damage done, with engravings within the floor from the beast's claws and bloodshed galore, offering a visual reminder of this night's traumatic events. A dread almost as intense as during the conflict formed in my mind. What would happen now that we knew a werewolf was stalking our town brutally and seemingly relentlessly? The following days passed in an uneasy blur between busy emergency rooms and futilely detailing encounters with local police who couldn't understand or accept the supernatural at play. It was during this time that a wise elderly woman living on the outskirts of town approached me in sheer desperation while rumors ran amok regarding our bar fiasco. She possessed old knowledge long held exclusively by her family. It told of a terrible curse that had befallen certain bloodlines within our region centuries ago. Despite best efforts to contain it and prevent tragedy, she lamented how every once in a blue moon the werewolf would rise up uncontrollably upon an afflicted individual until taken hold entirely by bloodlust. With a heavy heart, she confided that her own grandson was the latest to suffer such a fate, unable to put their loved one down for fear of consequences and contacting the authorities provided. She begged tearfully for our understanding and assistance in stopping evil spread through hiding, even if the uncovered truth brought no feeling of victory in its wake. I glanced over at Greg with his arm in a cast and Roger nursing several cuts and bruises. We knew we couldn't take on a werewolf alone, but sworn to secrecy from the old woman's pleading, there were few alternatives available. Rattled yet vengeful, after sharing her grandson's name during a last-ditch effort request, we agreed amidst hesitation to pinpoint where he could be found ourselves so that perhaps humanity may triumph over one plague by a wretched curse before inevitable darkness consumed our town once more. This story is called Werewolf Ravages in Silverstone, from The Shadow Teller 69. Let's begin. This happened to me on October 13th, six years ago. I was walking home from my job as a theater projectionist when I noticed that the once crowded street had suddenly become deserted. The unsettling quiet fell over my surroundings, making me uneasy. My house was still a block away, and a sense of urgency motivated me to quicken my pace. As I turned the corner onto Oak Ridge Lane, my neighbor, Mrs. Delaney, stumbled out of her house, frantically waving her arms around and screaming bloody murder. She looked absolutely devastated and horrifyingly frightened. Her eyes were wide with terror, and she was in complete disarray. Mrs. Delaney, what on earth happened? I asked, alarmed by her reaction. My husband. Something attacked him. I can't even. There's so much blood. Call an ambulance. She wailed, struggling to put the situation into words. I pulled out my phone to call 911 but realized the battery had died. Frustration and fear mounting, I helped Mrs. Delaney back into her home to discover the gruesome scene she described. Mr. Delaney had been torn apart by something unlike anything we'd ever encountered or heard of before. The first responders arrived shortly after and treated Mrs. Delaney for shock while assessing Mr. Delaney's remains with a grim expression. The paramedics exchanged worried glances with one another, 
evidently uncertain of what could have caused such fatal carnage. A police officer approached me and inquired about anything suspicious I might have seen or heard before discovering the disaster inside the house. I hesitated momentarily, hoping to recall any unusual events, before recollecting something important, just mere moments before Mr. Delaney's remains were discovered. Actually, yes, I said cautiously. I heard a strange howling coming from the woods nearby. It wasn't like an ordinary animal or anything I've ever encountered. Could that be any use? The officer frowned thoughtfully, scribbling down my statement before temporarily leaving me to ponder my contribution. As days went by, tensions rose in the small town of Silverstone. More bizarre animal attacks were reported, each one more horrifying than the last. People exchanged speculation and urban legends about recent events, with some even mentioning possible werewolf connections. My roommate, Lena, approached me with that idea one day while we huddled in our living room, doors and windows tightly secured against any outside abomination. You know what they're saying, right? she asked nervously. That's some sort of werewolf, I replied skeptically. Yeah, I've heard those absurd rumors. But do you really believe that? Lena shivered before responding quietly. I'm not sure what to believe anymore. That night, as sleep kept both of us at bay, the howls returned louder than ever before. The eerie cries permeated through our home's walls and echoed throughout the empty streets. The once-come autumn night had become a cacophony of spine-chilling sounds. Heart pounding with fear and curiosity, we crept closer to the window to catch a glimpse of whatever creature created such dreadful noises. Our hands shook as we pulled back the curtains just slightly to peek out into the darkness. And there it was, standing under the streetlight about a hundred feet away, an enormous figure, unlike anything we had ever seen before or could have ever imagined existed. The creature hunched over on its hind legs and was covered in massive patches of disheveled fur. Its yellow eyes glinted malevolently at us before letting out another blood-curdling howl. In that instant, sheer terror overwhelmed me, and my instinct screamed one single word in my head, Run! But then we realized that we were trapped inside our house with nowhere else to go. A sudden crash from the kitchen interrupted our thoughts, followed by the sounds of broken dishware and bones crunching relentlessly. Before taking a step toward the kitchen to investigate, despite our better judgment, we remembered what had happened to poor Mr. Delaney. Could this be his attacker confirming our greatest fears? What would become of us? Lena and I decided it was time to call for help. Despite earlier hesitations, we picked up the phone and dialed 911, only to be met by eerie silence. Our phone line had been cut, leaving us isolated and vulnerable. We moved through the house in a desperate attempt to escape from our impending doom but noticed that all the doors were inexplicably jammed shut. Panic set in as we realized that we were trapped with an unthinkable evil lurking just outside. My next thought was our closest neighbors, Tom and Sarah, who lived half a mile away. If we could somehow make it to their house— They'd surely welcome us inside and offer the shelter needed to weather this storm of horror. Lena agreed, and we prepared ourselves to sprint out into the night with nothing but our wits and determination. As soon as the creature moved out of sight, we bolted out of the house, taking well-trodden paths while avoiding streetlights that might betray our position. Painstakingly, we reached Tom and Sarah's place without incident. They welcomed us with looks of sheer terror etched across their faces. They too had witnessed chilling scenes of carnage around the town that couldn't be explained by anything natural or normal. Tom owned a hunting rifle, 
which he retrieved from his storage room. It wasn't much against an unknown beast, but it would have to suffice. He fortified their doors and windows while Lena, Sarah, and I huddled in their living room, discussing plans for when daylight came. The howling continued into the night, echoing our shared fears for what horrifying death awaited those caught in the claws of this thing terrorizing Silverstone. Our sense of time slipped away as terror held us captive in its unyielding grip. The following morning, the sun began appearing on the horizon. Exhausted from fear and lack of sleep, Lena and I embraced the sunrise as a symbol of hope. We ventured outside armed with Tom and his rifle, for both protection and resolve in driving away the monstrous creature. In broad daylight, its grisly work was even more apparent. Bodies of friends and neighbors lay scattered across town, lives forever extinguished by a devastating evil. Each gore-filled scene gave us more determination to confront and repel whatever unseen force plagued our once peaceful village. The four of us frantically tried to rally the remaining townsfolk, urging them to seek safety numbers and to be vigilant against further attacks. We couldn't allow this nightmare to continue unopposed. That evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, a group of us huddled together in Tom and Sarah's fortified house, each person grasping onto any semblance of hope and comfort we could find in the face of unknown terror. And then, as if on cue, that howl pierced through our fragile sense of security. The standoff began. Hours crept by at a torturous pace with adrenaline temporarily staving off our immense sleep deprivation. Suddenly, there was an almighty crash at the front door. Everyone braced for impact, knowing it was now or never. The creature bared its monstrous form in full view. It was then that I knew we were dealing with a werewolf. With first licking from blood and its rancid breath filling our nostrils, the werewolf lunged towards us with a perverse hunger reminiscent of nightmares turned reality. Weak sunlight streamed into the room, set ablaze with enhanced reflections from broken glass, as the creature cast its blood rage upon Silverstone survivors. My name is Vincent, and I used to be a regular guy with a 9-to-5 job in downtown Chicago. Just before Christmas, on December 14, 2019, as the cold winter air encroached upon the city, my life was flipped upside down. As I walked home from work one evening, I decided to take a shortcut through an alleyway. It seemed like any other path I'd taken home before that night, but as soon as I stepped foot into the dimly lit passageway, something felt off. My senses tingled as the smell of rotten eggs hung heavy in the chill air. Initially, I paid no heed to it, but something told me my instincts were right. Well, Vincent, I muttered to myself. You're up to your eyeballs in student loan debt and living in a shoebox apartment. What could possibly be worse than your life right now? My attempt at humor fell flat in the eerily quiet alley. I continued making my way through the gloom but halted as a foreign sound echoed around me. It was horrifying, a gut-wrenching combination of nails screeching across glass and animalistic snarls. The sharp-edged wall opposite me momentarily rustled with some fleeting disturbance out of my sight line. That was when fear gripped me, and I knew that whatever was stalking me from beyond my view was anything but an innocent passerby. Sweat formed on my brow despite the cold weather as whatever hid behind the darkness began to move once more. Large clawed feet scraped against the gravel-laden pavement and moved closer with each second. Don't panic, I whispered urgently to myself, 
attempting to remain calm in this ancient adrenaline game of fight or flight. As the heavy-footed beast rounded the corner of the wall, its wolf-like form emerged fully into view. A canine-featured face stared at me with malicious, feral, sharply intelligent eyes under the dim streetlight just overhead. Blood was smeared across its snout and fur, adding to the raw dread seeping through my veins at this moment. I suddenly remembered that I had a pocket knife in my coat, not that it could do much against this imposing creature. But it was all I had. My hands trembled as I fumbled for the knife, trying not to make a sound. As I clicked it open, a group of friends stumbled around the corner onto our quiet battleground, their voices loud with the sound of nighttime revelry. The beast looked toward them and seemed to size each one up as an option for its next meal. Run! Run! I bellowed at them, doing my best to steer their intoxicated bodies away from the demon dog that lurked nearby. Finally, one of the group shouted back, What's your problem, man? As we argued about whether or not they should flee for their lives, I saw my chance to escape unharmed slip by. The violent canine grew more agitated with each word exchanged between humans and approached slowly, tension coiling in its muscles. With a piercing howl that rattled my bones, it sprang forward suddenly as one of my new companions clumsily tried to wrestle the knife from me, their misplaced bravado putting everyone on edge. In that single instant, everything merely stopped. It was as if the very air itself braced against what was about to happen, a horrifyingly distinct display of power emanating from this merciless monster. The moment the beast leaped toward us, I instinctively shoved the guy wrestling for the knife to the side, shielding him from the attacker. The ferocious dogman focused on tearing at my clothing with its razor-sharp claws, tearing through fabric and flesh with ease. Call the police! I screamed, hoping that my would-be companion would snap out of his bravado and understand the gravity of our situation. He hesitated for a moment before taking off down the alley, clumsily dialing his phone while trying to tell others to get help. I grappled desperately with the monstrous creature, feeling slick blood pool around my feet and smelling copper as it mixed with that rotten egg stench. The pain was unbearable, but I knew that if I faltered now, it would be the end for me. The reality of this creature's existence was as bizarre as it was terrifying, but there was no time for dwelling on it now. With all my remaining strength, I plunged my tiny pocket knife into one of its unblinking eyes, knowing full well that it was a futile attempt at killing this beast. To my relief, however, the blade seemed to cause a level of discomfort I hadn't thought possible. The vile dog momentarily released its grip on me, allowing me precious time to limp away while clutching my bleeding wounds. As I stumbled through Chicago streets, uncaring about the bewildered glances from passers-by, I eventually found refuge in a nearby hospital's emergency room lobby. Pale and shaking from blood loss, I found myself being asked countless questions about what had happened while doctors frantically attempted to close my wounds. After spending several days in recovery under constant watch from both medical professionals and law enforcement, who seemed unwilling to take any word about monstrous creatures seriously, an older gentleman with graying hair and thick glasses visited me. My name is Dr. Thomas. He introduced himself as he entered my room. I work in the field of cryptid research, and I believe you had an encounter with a creature we've been tracking for some time. My ears perked up at the mention of it, for despite the lack of details provided, I knew that this man was referring to the very beast that nearly claimed my life. 
Dr. Thomas proceeded to explain that this horrible, dove-like phenomenon was commonly known as werewolfish torturous within his circle of researchers. Believed to be a demonic werewolf hybrid, it appeared randomly throughout history, with numerous eyewitness accounts of its brutal attacks. Before leaving my hospital room, Dr. Thomas handed me a card displaying his contact information, offering his support should I ever need it. He didn't seem at all surprised by the existence of such a terrible menace, which left me even more uneasy than before. After finally being discharged from the hospital and without any trace of the werewolfish torturous to speak of, I struggled to return to my mundane life in Chicago. I couldn't help but be disturbed by the eerie knowledge that somewhere out there, this formidable creature walked amongst us and, sooner or later, would strike again. I pondered over Dr. Thomas's parting words as I picked up the card he'd given me. Please remember that knowledge is power, Vincent. The more informed we are about these creatures and their habits, the better equipped our world becomes to combat their threats. Staring at my scars in the mirror each morning, their constant reminder drove me to forge a new purpose for myself. Using Dr. Thomas as my mentor, I delved into the realm of cryptid research, hoping to play some small part in preventing others from becoming victims like me. But deep down inside, one question still haunted me. Would we ever truly be free from such evil? The revelation of cryptids and the demons stalking our world left me with an uneasy feeling of a future carved in darkness. No matter how hard I tried to return to my boring life, the ominous truth would forever linger in my mind, driving me to unravel more secrets and face those blood-curdling creatures hiding in the shadows of society. Feeling exhausted after a long day at work, I dragged myself towards my regular bus stop in the quiet town of Denville, New Jersey. The sun had retreated beneath the horizon, painting the sky hues of orange and purple. So, did you catch the game last night? A fellow commuter asked me with a wide smile. I let out a light-hearted chuckle. You mean that painful but hilarious debacle? No doubt. We exchanged a few short chuckles, and there was something warming about the calm of an otherwise ordinary day. The winds began to pick up, rustling through the treetops overhead. As we waited for the bus to arrive, I noticed something that caught my attention, an eerily intense stench lingering near the wooded area close to our stop. Ignoring it at first, we continued to discuss mundane matters. That was until other passengers began noticing it as well. Curiosity peaked, and barely stifling our gag reflexes, we approached the source of that ominous stench. As we edged closer, we came across a torn and partially shredded backpack protruding from between trash bins. My heart raced as I carefully picked up the heavy bag and cautiously unzipped it. Inside were photographs, faces of missing children from recent months strewn across local papers and TV news broadcasts. One of my fellow commuters instantly dialed 911 to report our discovery. The air suddenly felt dense, like oxygen was evaporating around us. The very next day, widespread panic gripped our once serene town. This gruesome revelation sent police and residents alike into frenzy, searching for answers. Fear coursed through every vein running through my body in search of answers that would never come. As days rolled into weeks, evidence emerged from all corners pointing toward one focal point, a mysterious presence haunting our town. Reports of strange sightings emerged in droves, a large figure standing at almost seven feet tall, 
with elongated claws scrawled deep gashes into trees and glowing red eyes that bore into the core of your very existence. At first, people disregarded these comments as mere fabrications, figments spawned by scared minds. But when once cynical men and women began to recount an identical predator, we couldn't keep up the facade any longer. The nightmare was real. News reports labeled this otherworldly entity as the Denville Demon. Rumors swirled about it killing for sport and scratching cryptic symbols on its hunting grounds that depicted an ancient rite. Security cameras failed to capture the creature's image, as if it had the power to manipulate electronic devices or simply knew how to evade detection. As sightings mounted, whispers of even more terrifying encounters surfaced among our neighbors. Those who were lucky enough to escape the clutches of this monster recounted their ordeal in fractured, hushed tones. Blood-curdling screams cut the night like jagged knives, only to be answered by a harrowing snarling cackle. An emergency town hall meeting soon followed. A passionate detective gave us her word that she would bring this reign of terror to an end even though she privately confided that she had never encountered such an elusive foe that made her feel utterly powerless. The following evening, we didn't need warning sirens blaring through our streets. As I returned home from work and made my way toward the safety of my front door, I froze, faced with those dreaded symbols etched across my lawn. My entire being trembled as I felt the weight of an unfamiliar presence creep up behind me, an all-consuming gaze burning into my back with a palpable focus. I squeezed my eyes shut, knowing that in that moment, everything was on the line. With a pounding heart, I instinctively dashed into my house, slamming and locking the door behind me. My panic-stricken mind ran through a plethora of options to defend myself, my family, and our home. Rationalizing that it would be too risky to confront the creature alone, I called the detective, who had vowed to put an end to this reign of terror. Detective Norelli, she answered. How can I help? I quickly recounted the events unfolding outside my house the symbols on my lawn, the chilling presence, and the perilous situation we were all facing. I'm on my way, Detective Norelli replied without hesitation. Soon after, I saw her patrol car pull up outside my window. In that moment, the lingering presence behind me vanished as suddenly as it had appeared. The detective cautiously approached my lawn and began assessing the ominous symbols etched into the grass. She confirmed what we all dreaded. These were indeed markings related to the Denville Demon's gruesome activities. The next few days were a blur. Norelli organized a task force dedicated solely to apprehending this inhuman menace. She also brought in an expert on mythological creatures who revealed surprising and frightening details about our assailant. He was no demon but rather a dogman or werewolf by origin, with roots in ancient folklore. Their collaboration led Norelli's task force into a corner of Denville, where they discovered a dilapidated cabin. The walls inside were adorned with pictures and newspaper clippings of missing children along with detailed notes describing their markings and rituals. We came face to face with the carnage inflicted by this cold-blooded beast in our own backyard. As I tried to wrap my mind around all this information, there was one element that kept haunting us collectively. How do we even plan on defeating something so deeply entrenched in darkness? A brilliant stroke of intuition from Detective Norelli quickly devised a tactical plan to capture the creature. We would set up a stakeout in the vicinity of highly trafficked areas near the woods. The goal was to catch this infamous predator off guard while he was scouting potential human targets. 
Meanwhile, others from law enforcement would launch an attack, driving in from different directions and surrounding him. As we readied ourselves for this titanic struggle ahead, our hopes dimmed, knowing that we were pitting our mortal selves against a creature bred in mythology and bound by no known set of rules. Our nerves frayed under the weight of this knowledge and anticipation, which built within us like boiling magma. On the night of our carefully planned operation, we took our position strategically around its hunting grounds, at a safe distance yet close enough to converge when it presented itself. The air thickened with tension so palpable that you could almost taste it. Suddenly, movements alerted us to its ominous presence. Glowing red eyes pierced through the darkness, announcing its arrival. In that split second, our training kicked in and ironclad determination settled upon us like an impenetrable fortress. We initiated our battle cry and launched unrelentingly into action. Bullets pierced the air like vengeful thunderbolts as terrified officers scrambled frantically about trying to corner their terrifying nemesis. In pitch darkness amid panic-stricken screaming and blood-curdling snarls, positions were lost and orders were unheeded as chaos unfolded rapidly. Just as suddenly, that dreaded monster vanished into thin air, leaving an eerie silence in its wake. Shaken but alive, most of us emerged from the conflict physically unscathed. Sworn to secrecy about what truly transpired that night, we rationalized that the legend of the Denville Demon would be far too horrifying for most people to digest if revealed. Yet now, more than ever, I can't help but ponder, did we drive this wretched beast away or simply agitate it even further? What terror could the future hold if a creature so powerful and elusive considers us a newfound threat? This story is called The Howling Night of Terror, from Unnerved Traveler 54. Let's begin. This happened to me on October 16th. 2012. I just got off work at the bank and had decided to carpool with my coworker Alice. She lived a few blocks away from me and was kind enough to offer me a ride whenever our schedules aligned. Despite not being close outside of the office, these shared moments forged a bond that went beyond small talk and coffee breaks. Alice had recently gone through a tough breakup and I couldn't help but offer her some support. We were driving down the main road of our small town when suddenly, a pungent smell filled the air. It was an overpowering scent of rot and decay, forcing us to quickly roll up our windows. Just as we passed the old cemetery, I glimpsed something completely unexpected out of the corner of my eye. What on earth is that? I asked Alice as she slammed on the brakes. Lying near the entrance gate was a mangled heap of torn metal and shattered glass. The remnants of what was once a car were now barely recognizable. A heart-stopping crash had occurred right in front of us. As we climbed out of Alice's car to investigate further, the smell intensified. We started to approach the wreckage with trepidation when we both stopped in our tracks positioned among the debris was an ominous sight. Deep claw marks left behind on an otherwise untouched tree trunk adjacent to the accident site. Feeling scared yet intrigued, Alice whispered in disbelief, Do you think it could be? I don't know, I replied nervously, because there was no way this could be real life. We decided it was best not to poke around any more and called 911 immediately. The police came shortly and closed off the area as they interrogated witnesses and conducted their investigation. In the following days, our small town was in a tizzy. Murmurs and theories floated around like a haunting fog, 
casting a heavy sense of unease over every conversation. From what we had gathered, strange occurrences were on the rise. I learned from Alice that her neighbor's dog had been found brutally torn apart one evening in their backyard. The children in town were sharing stories of ghostly night terrors and strange footprints discovered outside their windows. And then it happened once again. This time, I was alone at home when I heard a scratching sound right outside my door. I hesitantly looked through the peephole to find nothing but darkness, yet the noise persisted. Overwhelmed by fear, I called Alice for help. She arrived promptly, within minutes, and notified law enforcement. As we sat together waiting for the police to arrive, we couldn't shake off the growing horror that something sinister was lurking in our small town's shadows. Suddenly, we heard footsteps getting louder and closer. Our nerves were at an all-time high as sweat soaked our foreheads and fear clenched our stomachs with an iron grip. It must be the police. I flung open the door and let out an involuntary gasp of panic. Chills crept down my spine as my eyes locked onto what appeared to be claw marks, the same unsettling ones from before, on my front porch railing. Neither Alice nor I could form words. We stood frozen while waiting for the police cruiser to pull up outside my house. When the officer entered my home, he took one look at the claw marks and grew visibly alarmed. Even with his presence, we couldn't shake that unbeatable fear inside us. Alice decided to stay with me for a few days so that we could support each other through this unnerving ordeal. But as each night passed, our fear of being watched intensified. Strange noises echoed throughout our once comforting homes keeping us on edge in a perpetual state of unease. Our shared experiences deepened our bond beyond work colleagues and into a genuine friendship, a silver lining to the dark cloud that loomed above our heads. One night, while taking out the trash, I heard it, the faint howling in the distance that made my blood run cold. The chilling sound grew louder as terrible snarls joined the cacophony. My body began to shut down, paralyzed by terror. I quickly retreated to the safety of my home and alerted Alice. Though dreadful as it was, it ceased as abruptly as it started. We quickly devised a plan to protect ourselves. Alice suggested we stay in her house since it had a basement with no windows, making it harder for whatever was lurking outside to get in. The strange occurrences continued, each one more unnerving than the last. Despite our fortified sanctuary, we felt anything but safe. The situation became dire when my neighbor called, fear and panic lacing every word as she described witnessing the grisly aftermath of another attack. Her voice trembled as she described how her husband had been dragged from their home. The responding officers found his dismembered body just outside their front door. Shock and grief quickly gave way to an undeniable determination. We needed to find a solution fast. Our best defense was installing security cameras and floodlights around Alice's house. This would allow us to monitor the perimeter from the safety of the basement, while providing some semblance of protection, albeit limited. One evening, while reviewing the footage, we witnessed something truly terrifying, an immense creature stalking the edge of Alice's property. It stood on two legs like a human but was covered in thick gray fur with glowing yellow eyes that burned into our very souls through the camera lens. Our initial disbelief turned to horror when we saw it wipe away its muzzle with a massive paw the same size as those claw marks we had seen earlier. Piecing together all these events and matching them with ancient local folklore, we knew who, or rather, what was behind it all, a werewolf. We were too afraid to confront this creature ourselves. 
but notifying law enforcement seemed pointless as they were already overwhelmed by the recent incidents plaguing our town. Realizing we didn't have much choice and without any practical means to combat this supernatural threat, we finally decided to reach out for help from an expert in paranormal activity. A renowned researcher based in our area promptly responded and arrived at Alice's house not long after contact. After carefully studying our evidence and listening to our stories, the researcher outlined a plan to trap and immobilize the werewolf without harming it. That night, we put this new defense strategy into action in hopes of ending the nightmare that had consumed our lives. Under the guidance of our newfound ally, we carefully set traps and sought positions where we could witness the confrontation with the werewolf from a safe distance. The howling grew louder as the creature arrived on Alice's property. We held our breath, watching as it stepped closer and closer to one of our carefully crafted snares. And then it happened. The creature's massive paw triggered the trap and powerful cables wrapped around its body and limbs. It snarled and snapped in fury as it struggled to escape, but the trap held firm. We regrouped with our paranormal expert, who began chanting ancient spells intended to subdue and calm the werewolf. As each incantation reached its peak, we could see the effect on the creature. Its eyes dimmed while its struggle weakened. Hours passed, and eventually it was done. The beast slumped in its restraints, subdued and quiet. We couldn't believe our luck or that such a frightening legend of supernatural terror was now under control within Alice's backyard. The paranormal expert explained that this particular werewolf had likely been roaming these lands for centuries before our town was built, terrorizing generations of inhabitants. As we stood by in awe while he continued his work on the creature, we allowed ourselves a small moment of relief. We had won this battle for now, but we knew that something so ancient could never be completely eradicated from existence. In an instant, three exhausted souls were united by their shared experience, knowing that this age-old terror may only be dormant temporarily waiting for another opportunity to unleash its wrath on an unsuspecting world. And so ended our brush with an unimaginable horror, the werewolf mere yards away in Alice's backyard. Bound but not broken, a reminder that some legends are anything but mere tales. This story is called The Red Men Feast, from Crescent Moon Watcher. Let's begin. This happened to me on January 21, 2019. Clarence Thompson and I were rearranging the furniture in my cozy living room at my house in Cheyenne, Wyoming. At the time, we thought it was just another mundane project, something to fill the dull hours of winter. Little did we know that our lives were about to change forever. As the evening set in, we flung open the window blinds to let some natural light enter the room. We laughed and conversed like old friends tend to do, but our merry discussion was interrupted by an ear-piercing scream echoing from outside. We raced to the window, and there beneath the dimming sky, we saw Mrs. Emily Harris, our usually timid elderly neighbor, hurling herself out of her front door, her face pale and clothes soaked in what looked like fresh blood. Blinking rapidly into the settling gloom, we feared for her life. Swallowing hard, Clarence and I knew that it was up to us to call for help. My phone had shut down after an unfortunate mishap with a coffee spill earlier that morning, so Clarence darted to his car to retrieve his forgotten device from its charging port. As soon as he dialed 911 and informed them of Emily's dire situation, 
A lump formed in my throat when I realized I hadn't heard her screams since he began speaking to the dispatcher. Clarence caught on too, exchanging an uneasy look with me as he hung up. Our curiosity got the better of us, and we made our way towards Emily's house, although we made sure not to trespass on her property. As we approached the edge of her yard, we finally noticed clear tracks leading from her door into the thicket of trees behind her dwelling. The sight blanched our faces. Whoever, or whatever, had caused Emily's blood-curdling scream left behind a grotesque smear of gore stretching like a gruesome ribbon into the dark forest. It was painful to think about our elderly neighbor lumbering through those sinister woods, and an uncomfortable silence fell between Clarence and me. Despite our better judgment, we knew that we couldn't wait for help to arrive, nor could we turn away from someone in such dire need. Deliberating no longer, my heart hammered in my chest as we crept cautiously yet determinately into the woods, following the dreadful trail that Emily's tormentor had left. As we wove our way through looming trees that seemed to grasp at us with bony, desperate fingers, I couldn't help but crack a feeble joke to Clarence. This is like one of those terrifying campfire stories you told when we were kids. Remember? He chuckled nervously. Yeah, but I never imagined something like this would happen in real life. The farther we ventured into the gloom, the more the nausea-inducing path continued and grew. I furrowed my brow as my eyes adjusted to the dim light filtering through the withered branches above. Hey, do you see that up ahead? Next to that overturned wheelbarrow? Clarence squinted ahead where I was pointing. Upturned soil flanked by a moonstone amulet lay in disarray. It looked significant considering its isolation in an eerie setting. I do. Something strange about this place. I don't like it, Clarence whispered. As if in response to his words, a horrifying growl echoed through the shadows. This was no ordinary growl, though. It was guttural and predatory, like some monstrous beast tore itself from the bindings of myth or folklore to snatch life from our world. We hugged with horrified expressions as we instinctively backed away from the chilling sound. That's when it struck me. We were in the presence of a werewolf. There was no other rational explanation for the sheer volume and rage radiating from that primal growl. Terrified, Clarence whispered, We need to leave now. Just then, we heard the howl of an ambulance siren approaching Emily's house. Believing our efforts were in vain and knowing policemen were arriving with paramedics, we heeded Clarence's words. We quickly retreated from the woods, leaving the gruesome scene behind. The paramedics and police rushed towards Emily's house and we watched as they stabilized her and attempted to ask questions about her attacker. Emily seemed too exhausted and traumatized to provide any coherent information. As days turned into nights, fear enveloped our neighborhood. No one dared venture out after dark, and loud noises would make everyone jump. The local authorities installed extra security cameras and increased their patrolling while attempting to piece together what could cause such vicious attacks. Clarence had his phone on him at all times, often listening to police scanner updates and sharing them with me. Some of our neighbors started forming a watch group, taking turns observing the area throughout the night. Still, I couldn't help but notice that no one ever dared go near the woods where we had found Emily. More time passed, and whispers of a werewolf spread through our town like wildfire. Parents wouldn't let their children play outside alone, even though no one could prove the werewolf's actual existence. One afternoon, Clarence and I were walking home from work when we spotted fresh claw marks on a tree near the woods' entrance. 
fear gripped our stomachs as we realized that this was likely the same creature that attacked Emily. The next night, another attack occurred in a house right next to the woods. A man had been savagely mauled in his backyard while grilling dinner for his family. When we heard about it, Clarence insisted we remain indoors until this monster was dealt with, but my curiosity got the better of me. With flashlights in hand, I snuck out late at night to search for any indication of who this attacker might be or why they were terrorizing our once peaceful town. As I approached a nearby creek that bordered the woods, my eyes caught a glimpse of something enormous crossing it further upstream. Despite trembling hands, I managed to snap a blurry picture of the beast. I returned to our house and showed Clarence the image as proof of something unnatural stalking our town. We agreed that we needed to provide this evidence to the authorities and convince them to call in reinforcements. The following day, we showed the photograph to the police chief. He studied it intently before sighing heavily, admitting there had been other reports of something strange within the woods. The coming days saw the arrival of specialist hunters who set up a perimeter around the forest and entered with an arsenal of weaponry. We held our breath, praying that they could bring peace back to our community by eradicating whatever was lurking among the trees. It wasn't until late one night that I heard strange noises outside my window. I cautiously peered out, expecting to see another attack happening in our once safe neighborhood. Instead, I saw a hunched figure, human-like but not quite right, crouching next to the remains of a recently devoured animal. The creature seemed injured, and as I watched it struggle, it transformed before my eyes into what appeared to be an ordinary man. My breath caught in my throat as I realized that this man had suffered from something more ancient and sinister than anything modern medicine could cure. It turned out that werewolves were more real than anyone could have imagined, simply hiding among us, their darkest secret buried deep within. I was on my way back after attending a college reunion in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was May 4, 2010, and the reunion had been a good time. Catching up with old friends and reliving memories had left me feeling nostalgic. The drive back was long but oddly coming as I drove my trusty old Ford Taurus down the familiar highway. Man, I could really use some coffee. I mumbled to myself as I eyed an old gas station ahead. It seemed to be one of those rundown places with a hint of eerie charm. Pulling in, I noticed an unusual silence washing over the area, as if the wind had decided to mute itself. Taking off my sunglasses, I stepped out of my car and sauntered over to the gas pump. As it filled up my car, I glanced around the barren station, wondering how long it had been since anyone had visited this place. Suddenly, there was a faint sound of rustling coming from nearby bushes. It wasn't anything alarming. In fact, it seemed like a completely normal occurrence for any wooded area near a highway. Probably just some raccoon. I chuckled to myself. My phone buzzed in my pocket. It was my mom sending me yet another cat meme along with DRIVE SAFE in capital letters, an endearing quirk of hers that never failed to bring a smile to my face. Just as I tapped reopen now on the touchscreen fuel pump display unit, something strange caught my attention, a rustling that seemed too loud to be coming from just one animal. Blinking away the weariness in my eyes, I squinted towards the direction where the noise was coming from. Still unable to discern what was going on over there, I hesitantly approached with caution. 
The darkness lurking behind the cover of thick trees made me uneasy at first, but my curiosity got the better of me. It was then that an overpowering stench filled the air. I covered my nose, feeling repulsed and nauseated. The closer I got to the source, the stronger it became. It was putrid but undeniably intriguing, unlike anything I had ever smelled before. As I ventured deeper into the trees, I noticed a tall figure standing in a small clearing within the forest. It appeared to be nearly seven feet tall, covered in thick fur, with massive clawed hands and an unnatural gait. Suddenly it turned to face me. The moonlight barely illuminated its grotesque features, its canine-like snout and menacing eyes, an unsettling mix of human and beast. Instantly, a chill ran through my entire body as fear gripped me tightly by the throat. Yet something kept me glued to the spot, frozen in place. The creature seemed to observe me as well, puzzled by my presence or perhaps even amused. Panic-stricken, I made a split-second decision, turn around and race back to my car as if my life depended on it, because it likely did. The adrenaline pushed me forward. Each breath felt labored as my legs pumped like a well-oiled engine. My surroundings blurred in panic, but that guttural growl reverberating behind me created a primal reaction, escape at all costs. Just before reaching my car, I could hear it gaining on me. The sound of ragged panting grew alarmingly louder, mixing with my own frantic breaths. I threw open the car door and jumped in, slamming it shut as the creature came into view. It stood there near the car, its breath steaming into the cold night air, claws scraping against the asphalt. My heart raced, but I couldn't call for help. This thing was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Who would believe me? And even if they did, would they arrive in time? I fumbled with my keys, started the engine, and drove it out of the gas station. I could see the creature in my rearview mirror, pursuing me on all fours with terrifying speed. Trying to catch my breath, I switched lanes and tore down the highway. As I drove further away from the gas station, I noticed that the creature seemed to slow down until finally disappearing into the darkness. A sense of relief washed over me briefly before being crushed under a haunting realization. Was this thing marking its territory? The scene at that gas station wasn't just an isolated encounter. There must be more victims scarred by this monstrous predator. The next morning, after spending a restless night at home, an inexplicable compulsion consumed me to learn more about what had just happened. While searching online for anything related to creatures like what I'd encountered, I stumbled upon a forum discussing an alleged werewolf sighting in Gettysburg. My mouse hovered over an embedded video titled, Dogman of Pennsylvania. With a shaky hand, I clicked play. To my horror, a massive dog-like creature with human features appeared on screen a dead ringer for what had chased me last night. Excited and terrified by my discovery, I sought out local experts on cryptids, creatures of lore or myth. An obscure cryptozoologist named James claimed to know about such creatures, specifically the dogmen of Pennsylvania, a werewolf-like monster said to terrorize people around Gettysburg. James told me of countless victims, their stories too similar to be mere coincidences. Some even lost their lives to the creature. Despite the collective knowledge they now had, the monster remained elusive, untouched by any attempts to capture or kill it. So with no better plan, I returned to the gas station. A trace of hope lingered. Maybe I could unveil something that would help stop this thing or at least protect others from its grasp. 
The site was cordoned off with bright yellow caution tape. A man in a rumpled suit, presumably a detective, questioned people passing by. My heart skipped a beat as he turned his attention towards me. Did you see anything last night? he asked bluntly. I, uh, saw some movement in the trees. I stammered, unsure of whether telling him all that had transpired would do any good. The detective eyed me cautiously before scribbling down some notes. We've been trying to figure out what happened here. We thought it was an animal but it's like nothing we've ever seen. Our conversation was interrupted by a spine-chilling howl echoing through the trees, a haunting reminder that the dogmen of Pennsylvania still roamed free. The color drained from both our faces, and we exchanged fearful glances as I wondered whether this monster's rampage would ever end. This story is called The Horrifying Howls of Moo Bathed Malevolence from Weary Reader 267. Let's begin. This happened to me on April 12, 2010. That day, I was exhausted after a long week of work, looking forward to a peaceful night in my small farmhouse on the outskirts of Butler, Ohio. My closest neighbors were miles away giving me the privacy and quiet I craved. However, the impending storm inside my home quickly lost its appeal. My best friend, Zoe, had been staying with me for a few days. We decided to curl up in the living room with some hot chocolate and watch our favorite crime documentary series. Her boyfriend, Raph, had joined us on the couch and joked about the ominous atmosphere outside. A few hours into our marathon, we heard a terrifying sound that made our laughter halt abruptly. The howling wind outside seemed to carry blood-curdling screams mixed with gut-wrenching cries of pain. At this point, curiosity and concern overpowered our fear. Not knowing what to expect, Zoe gingerly opened the front door, just enough for us to peek through it. Before our eyes lay a gruesome scene that would be burned into my memory forever. Two men stood across my yard, mutilated beyond recognition. Their entrails spilled across my fence line. As we looked on in horror-choked silence, we took notice that no one else seemed to be injured or missing in the immediate vicinity. All houses around mine still had their lights on. Individuals inside were completely clueless about what just unfolded. Reacting quickly, but foolishly, Raf rushed out to investigate and assist any survivors, while Zoe stayed behind to call 911. She reported the incident with trembling hands, clenching her phone tightly as I remained frozen at the door. As Raph approached the ghastly scene, his flashlight exposed long and deep gashes on the men's once recognizable features, their flesh nearly torn to shreds by markings that eerily resembled claw marks. Glancing around, he noticed large paw prints scattered erratically among the bloody mess. We heard Raph gasp as he caught sight of the dead men's tattered belongings strewn about. They seemed to have been stalked for some time before meeting their fates. The air was thick with fear and confusion when, suddenly, another terrifying howl echoed through the night. This time, the noise was uncomfortably close to our house. We knew it was no ordinary animal stalking the men, but we couldn't bear to ponder what might be lurking in the darkness outside. My heart raced at a nauseating pace as I struggled to keep my own panic at bay. The whale seemed so close that we half expected it to burst through the walls and pounce upon us any second. Raph sprinted back inside just as Zoe hung up the phone with emergency services. They assured us help was on its way, but a dreadful sinking feeling made me question whether it would arrive soon enough. 
As we barricaded ourselves within our bathroom, awaiting rescue, the night continued to grow darker and more sinister. The howls persisted, growing more frenzied and aggressive outside our very door. All three of us huddled in fear as we prayed that whatever caused this nightmarish reality would never lay claws upon us. And then, mercifully, silence fell. But our relief was temporary when we realized that a growl had replaced the howls, signaling that whatever monstrosity it was had drawn closer than ever before. The growling outside the bathroom door grew louder and more menacing. I glanced at Zoe and Raph, whose faces were ashen with terror. The door shuddered violently as something slammed against it, and we braced ourselves for what might happen next. Suddenly, there was a crash as the living room window shattered, glass flying everywhere. We heard the desperate cries of my neighbors, who'd come to check on us after hearing our screams earlier. What they discovered was a sight even more horrific than what we'd witnessed. The beast tore through them mercilessly, as if they were nothing but objects in its way. Bones snapped, blood splattered across the living room's walls, and the agonized cries of both men and women pierced the night air relentlessly. Moments later, the police arrived with their sirens blaring. The roaring of engines added to the cacophony assaulting our ears. Help had finally come, or so we thought, for it didn't take long for us to realize that even armed officers were no match for the savage creature that assaulted our sanctuary. The slaughter continued outside as we listened to our neighbors' final moments without being able to help them. I dialed 911 again and explained the situation in a rushed voice, that something had attacked us and killed several people, including officers sent to rescue us. Upon hearing this news, dispatch quickly alerted nearby forces, which included SWAT teams and specialized animal control units trained to deal with dangerous wildlife situations. They instructed us to stay locked inside until they could safely secure the area. Hours passed like an eternity while we waited in fear in that cramped bathroom together, shivering from cold sweat, fueled by fear and anxiety. It felt like forever before we finally heard men shouting orders outside our house. More vehicles came humming down our usually deserted road. We could tell when they confronted the monster by their exclamations of disbelief. We dared not move a muscle as they exchanged gunfire with the creature, doing their best to keep it at bay. And finally, it was over. Silence settled in once more around us, punctuated by the soft weeping of each of us within the bathroom. A knock on the door stirred us from our stupor, the authorities had defeated the dreadful creature and instructed us to come out immediately. As we exited our sanctuary, we saw the carnage that surrounded us. Everywhere lay the shredded remains of our neighbors, friends, and police officers who tried to help us but couldn't save themselves. The creature had been shot multiple times with heavy artillery. It lay motionless only barely recognizable as a massive wolf-like being, or so we initially thought. However, as its body transformed, we saw a horrifying truth. It was not a mere wolf or beast of any sort. It was a werewolf. In a chilling moment of clarity, Zoe recalled an old local legend passed down through generations, that our sleepy town had a dark history cursed with lycanthropy an affliction plaguing those who carried its bloodline and transforming them into werewolves. It seemed then that one of our own townsfolk had fallen victim to this curse, starting this cascade of bloodshed. As investigators combed through the ruins of our once peaceful home, we three vowed never to forget the horrifying howls of moon-bathed malevolence that shattered our lives on that fateful night.
This story is called The Fangs and Shadows, from Mist Follower 71. Let's begin. This happened to me in the year 2015, on November 3rd. My name is Jackie Connolly. I was living a pretty ordinary life, working at a small cafe in the forgotten corner of New Hampshire at the time all this happened. Nothing out of the ordinary ever occurred in our sleepy cafe, but it all changed that fateful day. I got off work late that evening and went to walk my dog, Kip. As we walked down our usual path through the woods, Kip seemed uneasy. He kept whimpering and sniffing the ground nervously. We came across an old house that looked as though it had been abandoned for ages. There were overgrown shrubs surrounding it, and its once white paint was now ghostly faded. As we were passing by, Kip's whimpering turned into sharp barks. He tugged at his leash towards the house as if trying to tell me something. All right, Kip, I sighed. Let's see what you've found. As we approached the front door, it swung open with a rusty groan, revealing a dark interior. We cautiously edged inside to explore further. Dust sheets littered the floor, and cobwebs hung from every available surface like creepy decorations. The only sound we could hear was our footsteps echoing cautiously around us. As we made our way deeper into the decaying house, I heard faint whispers drawing me toward the basement door. We descended slowly and hesitantly into eeriness, step by creaky step, stifling more than once in that musty air. When we reached the bottom of those ominous stairs, a foul smell engulfed us, an unholy mixture of rotting wood and death. I couldn't shake off an unsettling sensation crawling under my skin, as if unseen eyes were watching us. Kip growled as our eyes adjusted to the dim and flickering bulb above. Blood. Splatters of dried, crimson stains stained the floor beneath a heavy wooden table, on which lay various rusty blades, many still smeared with congealed blood. This was not just an old abandoned building. It was someone's gruesome playground. Panic rising in my chest, we raced back up the stairs. But just as we reached the top, Kip went utterly rigid with fear as he stared at something behind me. As I turned towards the horror Kip had locked onto, I caught a glimpse of it, a creature lurking in darkness nearby, fur-covered and unnaturally tall, its eyes beamed maliciously. Moonlight revealed razor-sharp fangs dripping with saliva, an unmistakable hunger for blood. Somehow stifling my scream, we scrambled to flee. The horrifying cacophony of the fiend's guttural laughter echoed through that house as if taunting me, but for now, we escaped untouched. Unfortunately, sleep eluded me for days following our encounter. The traumatizing sight of that basement scene and the memory of that monstrous creature fueled my fear to new heights. But it didn't stop there. Though I tried to ignore that chilling experience and focus on work, people began disappearing in town, all herbivorous animals left alive but unnaturally scared. Murmurs circulated about some cunning killer preying on our quiet town, Friends avoided one another's eyes when speaking in hushed whispers about the latest accident or tragedy. Jenny, a co-worker at the cafe and one of those rare stalwart souls amid our steadily dwindling population, finally broke down one day during a lull in business. I can't take this anymore, she confessed tearfully. I feel like that thing is following me. My heart skipped a beat. Until then, I hadn't told anyone. No one would have believed me. Abject terror reflected within her eyes held corpus to our mutual nightmare coming true. Whispering our validations frightened us more than solitary speculation could achieve. We agreed to meet after work lest numbers might provide us safety. 
I invited another mutual friend of ours, Brad, who also keenly felt more than general anxiety. Shivering together in bleak desolation, we hunkered down at my house, saying nothing but ensconced in shared dread. With Jenny and Brad by my side, we decided to call the local police. We hoped they could shed some light on the situation or at least offer some protection. But the officer on the line dismissed our story as pure hysteria, advising us to stay indoors and avoid wandering outside at night. Trying to devise an alternative plan, we focused on devising our best defense, closing all doors and windows enthusiastically, somewhat barricading ourselves in my home. Days passed without any incident, but that dread would not leave. We spend our time inside, each of us taking turns keeping watch through the windows. There was no sign of that terrifying creature or further disappearances, but we couldn't shake our anxiety with each passing day. Our daily lives were transformed into a tense survival vigil. Every strange sound became a potential warning and every stranger was eyed with suspicion. One night, while Jenny slept and Brad watched over her, an ear-splitting scream shattered the silence. I sprinted toward the source, finding Brad lying on the floor, barely conscious, glazed eyes staring into nothingness. Something attacked me. He choked out in between ragged breaths. It came through the window. It was so quick. We realized that staying inside wasn't protecting us anymore. We needed to change tactics if we wanted to survive. We reinforced the broken window and gathered any weapons we could muster. Kitchen knives, broomsticks sharpened into makeshift stakes, and a small axe from a camping kit. Bandaging Brad's wounds with trembling hands, I suggested we try seeking help from others in town. Perhaps others had seen signs or evidence that could help piece together what was happening. From house to house in our neighborhood, no one seemed to share our experience or knowledge about the evil presence haunting all of us. Tired and defeated after hours of fruitless questioning and hearing countless tales of unease representing only abstract suspicions whose existence was trickling into people's consciousness, we returned home. Later that night, unable to sleep due to anxiety, I kept watch by the window. Suddenly, I saw a disturbing scene, my neighbor's lifeless body being dragged away into the woods by none other than the same furry monstrosity we had seen before. It seemed that this creature didn't kill within our sight to avoid detection. We decided to follow it at a distance, armed with our makeshift weapons, hoping to learn more about its lair and intentions. The creature moved remarkably quickly through the foliage, but we managed to keep up with it, taking care not to alert it to our presence. Entering a clearing deep within the woods near an abandoned, dilapidated cabin, we witnessed something absolutely horrifying, the creature transforming into a human being. Blood still dripping from its jaws, this once looming beast now stood as one of us. I recognized the man, a local farmer who was seen often around town, but there was no time for contemplation. We decided it was time to call for help again, this time anonymously so it wouldn't fall on deaf ears, and relay our story to the authorities. As we made our way back home cautiously, Avoiding any chance encounters with other werewolves in hiding, questions haunted me. What had turned this seemingly ordinary man into a monstrous creature like the werewolf? Was he alone or part of a pack? And if there were others like him hiding among us, how could we ever feel safe again? This story is called Grotesque Symphony of Silent Howls, from Never Seen to Be True. Let's begin. 
This happened to me in the year 2017, on October 15th. Although I never believed in anything supernatural, just unexplainable for the moment occurrences, fate decided to thrust some grotesque reality upon me that day. My name is Lucas Lauren. I lived in a small town in Maine with my two friends, Danny Hayes and Kira Simmons. We shared a house, and sometimes we'd have little get-togethers at night with games and some beers just to stay connected despite our busy lives. That evening, we were talking about recent reports of bizarre animal behavior around the town. Farmers were complaining about their animals refusing to come out of their barns at night, staring at something as if they were terrified. Dogs nearby would howl nonstop at nothing but empty fields, as if an enemy were lurking there. It was very strange, even unsettling. Maybe it's a new virus or something? I suggested it half-jokingly. Kira shook her head, taking a sip from her beer. The vets checked everything out. Nothing unusual was found, she explained. I'm telling you guys, this town's starting to freak me out. After midnight, we wrapped up our party and said goodnight to each other. As I got ready for bed, an uneasy feeling washed over me. It felt like I was being watched. My room faced the street, and the blinds were wide open. I shook it off, shrugged to myself, and closed them before lying down. Suddenly, I heard an awful screeching sound outside my window. It sounded like metal scraping on metal. Then I heard something tumble and crash from our backyard, followed by gut-wrenching screaming. The horrifying mix of absolute terror and those wailing screams made my heart race. I dashed out of my room, slamming Aaron's and Danny's doors open, yelling, There's trouble outside! With no time to explain further, the three of us sprinted down the stairs and burst through the back door, fearing someone or something was attacking our neighbor. The sight that greeted us was beyond horrifying. Mr. Brown, our elderly neighbor who lived alone, was impaled on one of our broken fence posts. His frail body writhed helplessly, while a pool of blood stained the grass beneath him. In the darkness around him, Glimpses of shadows seemed to dance with joy at his suffering. Shielding Kira's eyes from the ghastly sight while panicking ourselves, Danny and I tried our best to keep our calm. I dialed for an ambulance on my phone, only to hear that they were already swamped due to several gruesome accidents around town. The seconds we stood there helplessly listening to Mr. Brown's shrill cries felt like an eternity. Suddenly, his screams were reduced to a strangled gurgle as he choked on his own blood. My heart refused to acknowledge what had just happened in front of us. It wasn't just fear. It was pure, unadulterated horror. Danny tried calling for help again, still holding up Kira, who looked like she could pass out any moment now. That's when we noticed the scratch marks all around Mr. Brown's yard deep gashes where the lawn itself had been torn apart. Those marks didn't resemble any animal we are aware of. They didn't even look remotely plausible. Kira sobbed quietly into Danny's shoulder, unable to bear what had unfolded before her eyes. As Danny comforted her by gently rubbing her back and whispering assurance into her ear, I couldn't tear my gaze away from Mr. Brown. It seemed so unnatural and unreal. As my eyes scanned for what could have caused this, I couldn't help but notice the darkness at the edge of the lawn seemed to be somehow alive. Moving slowly, almost breathing, my trembling fingers pointed toward it, and both Danny and Kira followed my gaze. It was as if an unseen force had suddenly gripped our throats. We couldn't breathe. Our eyes were locked into that darkness, the shadows merging and condensing into something beyond comprehension. 
Then the noises started, soft growls that quickly escalated into snarls so chilling that even our nightmares couldn't compete. We couldn't move or even speak as we stood there, petrified by the shadows and the horrifying snarls coming from them. The only sound we could hear now was our own ragged breathing, the distant sirens of ambulances trying to reach us, and other distress calls in town. Danny eventually managed to break free from the trance, grabbing Kira and me by the arm. We need to go inside, lock all the doors, and call for help, he urged, his voice barely a whisper. We nodded in agreement, unable to argue or come up with another plan. As we ran back inside the house, I frantically tried calling for help again but all the emergency lines were still busy. Danny decided that we should call our friends who lived nearby. Maybe one of them had an idea about what was going on. As he dialed their numbers, Kira sat at our dining table, eyes wide and unblinking. She was in too much shock to speak. Our friends didn't answer either, perhaps too panicked or busy dealing with their own horrors so calling for help wasn't an option anymore. My car, Danny said suddenly. We can escape this craziness for now and find out more later. He tossed us our jackets as we sprinted towards the front door. But before we could even touch the doorknob, another gut-wrenching, blood-curdling scream echoed outside. This time it was much closer. In fact, it was coming from right outside our door. My trembling hands managed to unlock the door as Danny tried to muster some courage. The moment that door creaked open, we saw Aaron, one of our friends from earlier at the party, lifeless on our porch, with deep claw marks carved through her body. Before we could react or process what happened to Aaron, something large jumped onto Danny from behind biting into his shoulder with unimaginable force. Blood splattered onto my face as I watched Danny's excruciating pain written all over his expression. Summoning every ounce of strength and courage left in me, I grabbed a metal pipe from the nearby garage and swung it at the monstrous creature. It yelled and let go of Danny, staggering back and giving us a window of opportunity to escape. With Kira sobbing uncontrollably and Danny crippled by pain, we hobbled to our car with the creature still writhing on the ground. I started the engine with trembling hands, blasting away from the scene without looking back. After driving for what felt like hours, we abandoned our car in the woods, tired and overwhelmed by fear. We had no idea what to do. All we knew was that we had to run, that something sinister, mysterious, and brutal had befallen our town. As we hid in the woods during those few days that followed, scraps of information from radio news reports revealed similar incidents occurring throughout our town, gruesome attacks and unexplained phenomena plaguing everyone. Eventually, people began to share their speculation online but there was one consistent theory among them that left me feeling nauseous. Werewolves. The more I thought about it, the more it made sense. The claw marks on Aaron's body, the powerful bite on Danny's shoulder, and all those poor victims left behind in terror. That's when I realized that this nightmare wasn't just about a random string of attacks. We were all living among werewolves who were now revealing their true nature. It was my first week as a junior hotel assistant at the sleazy sands in Surf City, North Carolina. I remember muttering something self-deprecating to my new co-workers about the supposed glamour of working at a beachside hotel. They chuckled, and I knew I was fitting in. There was an incident that occurred during my shift, one of those incidents that sticks with you like the smell of seaweed washed ashore. 
I just finished making beds and cleaning up the remnants of someone else's party in room 307 when my manager, Liano, approached me with urgency in his eyes. Hey, can you check on Mrs. Landry in room 401? She hasn't been responding to our calls or knocks on her door, Leano said, sounding equal parts concerned and annoyed. I nodded and made my way to the elevator, which groaned and creaked its way up to the fourth floor. The well-worn hallway smelled faintly of cleaning chemicals and cigarette smoke. Upon reaching room 401, I noticed scratches near the keycard slot, strange and unsettling marks that bore no logical explanation. Ignoring my instinct to turn back, I knocked loudly while announcing myself. Mrs. Landry? It's Jake from the front desk. Silence greeted me in response. Frowning, I looked around before finally swiping her room key through the electronic lock. As soon as the door swung open, there was a disconcerting sensation, like a chill dancing across my skin or a sudden urge to retch from some hidden putrid odor. Inside lay Mrs. Landry's lifeless body, bruised, battered, and shredded beyond recognition. My heart pounded in my chest as I gasped for air. Stumbling backward into the hallway, I managed to call out for help on the radio before sinking to the ground. In time, investigators swarmed room 401 like vultures around a carcass. Some whispered about a vicious and frenzied animal attack, while others suggested a sadistic and deranged killer. They talked about possible evidence of something ferocious and perhaps not altogether human. They asked if I noticed anything odd the previous night, something out of place or out of the ordinary, as if I would observe a towering werewolf checking in at the front desk. Days turned into weeks as I tried to force my thoughts elsewhere. But even during my sleep, Nightmares of those grisly images stained my dreams like blood on concrete. Every night, in the distance, I could hear the wailings of a creature haunting the beach, some unrecognizable growl that sent a chill down my spine. A month later, surfers from our hotel discovered an abandoned shack hidden by shrubbery on a cliff overlooking the beach. It had been ravaged and desecrated by something with an animalistic wrath. Could it be related to Mrs. Landry's death? Or was it purely coincidental in its timing? It wasn't long before strange happenings became all too common at the sleazy sands, cries in the night that echoed through vacated hallways, mysterious handprints in the sand that ended abruptly with no trace of returning footsteps and complaints from guests of chilling silhouettes blocking out the moonlight. One evening, after clocking out late from my shift, I had a terrifying encounter that would sear itself into my mind. Walking towards my car, an otherworldly howl tore through the air, far too close for comfort. It sounded neither like a wolf nor a dog but seemed to have traces of both. Yet there was something else lurking within that roar, something monstrous. I dared not turn around but bolted for my car instead, driven by pure fear and adrenaline. As I fumbled for my keys and listened to that gut-wrenching howl cut through the night, an ominous presence drew closer, its hot breath lingering over my shoulder. I locked the car and started its engine hurriedly making my escape from the hotel parking lot. My heart raced as the howls seemed to follow me through the streets. I drove aimlessly, trying to put as much distance as possible between me and whatever creature terrorized the hotel. As I sought refuge in a small diner on the outskirts of town, I met an old man at the counter who sensed my distress. He introduced himself as Henry a local who had lived in Surf City his entire life. Over a cup of coffee, he shared with me the legend of Sirnad, 
a malevolent beast that locals have whispered about for generations. According to Henry, Sirnod was once a skilled hunter who angered the gods by slaying their sacred wolves. In retribution, they transformed him into a grotesque, half-wolf, half-man monstrosity destined to roam the earth in search of prey. Mrs. Landry's fate bore an eerie resemblance to this old legend, as did those strange occurrences around the sleazy Sands Hotel. Henry warned me that Sirnod would continue hunting as long as he roamed free and that his insatiable hunger for human flesh only grew stronger each time he fed. Unfortunately, when asked about stopping Sirnod's rampage or even taking down the beast, Henry shook his head and spoke with remorse. There was no known way to destroy something cursed by the gods. I thanked Henry for his insight and decided not to involve him any further. It wasn't something I wanted anyone else to get mixed up in. Returning to the Sleazy Sands Hotel, I realized my responsibility was not just to protect myself but also to ensure no one else fell victim to this bloodthirsty creature. My plan was simple lay traps around the hotel grounds with wildlife cameras nearby so I could monitor what stumbled into them. After several sleepless nights spent watching the camera feeds, it finally happened. On one screen, the horrifying fusion of man and wolf emerged from the darkness, Sirnod. I watched as it prowled around my trap with the cunning intelligence of an apex predator. As much as I hoped that my preparations would be enough to ensnare him, Sirnod demonstrated a terrifying level of tactical awareness. That night, another guest in the hotel disappeared. All that remained were unspeakable remains and broken glass from their shattered window. In my quest to prevent further losses, I found a network of subterranean tunnels running beneath Surf City whose entrances and exits emerged near places where Sirnod had struck. These hidden passageways allowed him to hunt undetected and evade capture. Desperate for any advantage against this monstrosity, I used these tunnels to set elaborate traps and study the creature's patterns. Each time I faced Sirnod on his turf, sharp claws narrowly missed me, and blood-curdling snarls filled the air. Although my traps caused him pain and slowed his progress, it wasn't enough to take him down, they only enraged him further. With each passing encounter, I began to accept the cruel reality. Sirnod could not be killed or captured. My duty then became less about victory and more about surviving, holding off the menace long enough for others to escape its clutches. I continued working at the Sleazy Sands Hotel, where my sole purpose was saving lives. The guests knew nothing of their guardian against evil, nor did they suspect the dark depths their cheerful junior hotel assistant ventured into each night, engaging in a battle so fierce that it would rattle even the bravest soul. While Sirnod's legend lived on, whispered between generations as a tale too dreadful to confront, so too did my silent efforts persist, unknown and unseen but unyielding against an indomitable foe. This was my reality, my unique burden, a struggle without end against an adversary as immortal and insatiable as time itself. The eerie truth was that the cycle would never cease, yet, the strength to endure and protect others from the nightmare of Sirnod became my daily calling, one that refuses to let me rest or ever truly forget those already lost to the creature's merciless grasp. This story is called Whispers from the Crimson Moon by Twilight Hunter 19. Let's begin. This happened to me on March 4, 2014. As I was returning home from a long day of work, I found myself walking through the quiet streets of Salem, 
Massachusetts. Engrossed in my thoughts, I noticed something off about the area. There was a strange silence that blanketed the surroundings. I reached for my phone to call and inform my wife, Susan, about my late arrival when I caught a glimpse of something unusual lying on the ground near an old oak tree. With curiosity piquing my interest, I hesitated for a moment before approaching it cautiously. It looked like a mess of tattered clothing stained with crimson splotches, bizarrely torn apart. The sight took me aback, and an inexplicable sense of dread enveloped me. Granted, I wasn't faint-hearted, but this grisly discovery was chilling nonetheless. Not knowing what else to do, I called Susan to tell her what I saw and that we should contact the police about it. My mind raced through a multitude of possibilities as questions filled my head. What could have caused such destruction? Who could have been the person or thing responsible for this unsettling scene? The next few days were tense as rumors swirled around news stations about mysterious disappearances and gruesome findings similar to those I encountered that night. The town was on edge. Everyone was on high alert, with every little noise and movement making them skittish. Tom and Linda Barnes, who lived nearby our house, invited several neighbors over for a safety meeting one evening. Together, we brainstormed what actions could be taken to protect us all from any potential dangers that may lie ahead. There's nothing we can do without knowing exactly what we're dealing with, Tom said with frustration and fear in his voice. Linda chimed in. The police aren't sharing much information, and honestly, I'm not convinced they know anything themselves. Since then... The disquietude that hung over the once quiet streets has become unbearable. The sinister occurrences crept into the town's colloquialism, and whispered conversations were all too common. Despite efforts to downplay it with humor or dismiss it as town gossip, we could no longer ignore that something was very amiss in our community. A week had passed since I first stumbled upon the macabre scene near the oak tree, the moon was full and crimson, its glow cast eerie shadows upon the town. My sleep was restless as my mind was consumed by the recent distressing events. Trying to calm my nerves, I decided to take a midnight stroll through the neighborhood. I hesitantly stepped outside into the chilling air. As I walked along the now deserted streets, a strange feeling loomed in my gut. Eyes were watching me from somewhere unseen. That's when I heard it, a low growl resonating through alleyways and empty lots. A shiver ran down my spine as my heart raced uncontrollably. The sound grew louder, like a violent storm approaching from afar. Panic began to settle in as I frantically searched for shelter or safety. My legs felt like jelly beneath me as adrenaline coursed through my veins. Suddenly, I reached an old wooden fence blocking my path. With no other choice, I attempted to climb it, but my fumbling, trembling hands made every movement clumsy and slow. The guttural growl grew terrifyingly close, so close I could feel the warm, humid breath against my neck. Trembling in fear, I desperately tried forcing myself over the fence while beads of sweat trickled down my face. Just as I managed to heave my body over the fence, I felt a sharp pain in my calf, as if claws were sinking into my flesh. Despite the agonizing sting, I tumbled over the fence and hit the ground hard on the other side. Desperate to escape what was chasing me, I mustered all my strength and limped away despite the searing pain. My mind raced through the possibilities of who or what could help me. My neighbor, Jack, was a retired Marine and might have some valuable insight or equipment. I hobbled towards Jack's house, leaving a trail of blood behind me. Upon reaching his door, 
I pounded on it relentlessly until the porch light flicked on and a startled Jack appeared. What in God's name happened to you? He questioned, his eyes wide with alarm. Something's chasing me. I don't know what it is, but it attacked me near the fence. I explained hurriedly. Please let me in. I need help. Without hesitation, Jack ushered me inside and locked the door behind us. As we moved further into his living room, he pulled out his phone and dialed 911 while simultaneously fetching his first aid kit to tend to my injuries. The operator picked up quickly. 911, what's your emergency? Jack explained the situation briefly before placing the phone on speaker so that we both could hear what was happening. We'll send a unit right away, assured the operator. As we waited for help to arrive, Jack examined my leg closely. The scratches were deep and seemed almost deliberate in their placement. He applied bandages efficiently as we discussed potential weapons we could use for protection against the unknown threat. At some point during our conversation, we heard sirens approaching Jack's house. Relief swept over us momentarily until an unnerving sound echoed through the air. It appeared that whatever creature was after me didn't fear human authorities. The police officers entered the house guns drawn. They warned us that a silhouette fitting the description of a large predator had been spotted near Jack's property. Please stay inside until we have searched the area and determined it is safe, one officer insisted before carefully making his way outside. Minutes crawled by like hours as we waited silently in Jack's living room, electrified with fear and anticipation. Eventually, a young officer stepped back into the room, his face pale but determined. It's gone for now, but I don't think it will be long before it returns, he said cautiously. The best thing you can do for your own safety is to pack your essentials and relocate temporarily until we have apprehended whatever creature caused this. Taking his advice to heart, I returned home after being escorted by another officer. Susan and I swiftly gathered our belongings while the police patrolled our neighborhood. As Susan and I moved quickly through our home, preparing to leave, my mind was consumed by thoughts of the monstrous figure that had attacked me. What could possibly put an entire town on edge like this? And then everything made sense. Werewolves. The crimson moon that hung heavily in the sky was not just an eerie backdrop. It was the source of power for the creature hunting us down. In one realization, everything clicked as I understood what lurked in the shadows of Salem all along, werewolves driven by their bloodlust beneath this faded crimson moon. I'm telling you, Brett. Tuesday the 17th has to be the worst day for a final exam. I grumbled, walking alongside my best friend on the way to school. The fall colors in Nashville, Tennessee, painted a picturesque background, but my mind was far from appreciating the beauty of it all. Didn't you know? It said that bad things happen on Tuesday the 17th. Come on, Charlie. You can't be serious about that old wives' tale. Brett laughed as we passed through the school gates and joined the early morning chaos of students rushing to their classes. As I meandered through my classes, something felt off about the day. An eerie feeling lingered in my mind that wouldn't leave me alone. As evening approached and our final test ended, it was time for our usual after-school ritual heading to Maybe's diner for a well-deserved milkshake and slice of apple pie. Maybe's diner was just a short walk away from school, quaint on the outside and warm on the inside, with its checkerboard floors and classic fifties decor. 
As we sat down in our regular booth, Brett chuckled at my efforts to shake off my apprehensions about what he considered superstitious nonsense. You know, Charlie, finishing school tests isn't going to kill you. I scoffed before responding. You've heard some of the stories about Tuesday the 17th. Wouldn't it just be my luck for something terrible to happen? Brett raised his eyebrows doubtfully but glanced at his watch when something caught his eye outside the diner's window. Check out that guy over there. He looks like he hasn't slept in days. I followed his gaze to a tall man whose haggard appearance matched Brett's observation. The man was wearing a long coat that seemed tattered, as though it had seen better days. What drew our attention the most was the strange, wolf-like tattoo peeking from beneath his coat sleeve. It was so lifelike it appeared to dance and twist on his skin. As we stared, the man suddenly looked up and locked eyes with me. I shuddered and quickly turned away as our waitress, Emily, approached with our order. You shouldn't worry too much, boys. Emily chimed in after overhearing our conversation. There's no such thing as bad luck on a calendar day. Pay the guy no heed. He's probably just passing through. As I continued to mull over her words during our meal, I hoped she was right about the origin of that man's unearthly appearance. We left the restaurant hand in hand, only to notice that the strange man was gone, but we couldn't shake off an overbearing sense of being watched as we made our way home. The fog was rolling in thick and fast around us, lending an oppressive atmosphere to our already heightened sense of unease. The street lights cast distorted shadows that danced menacingly along our path, evoking a sense of foreboding. Once we reached my house, Brett attempted to lighten the mood before taking his leave. All right, Charlie. He smirked playfully. Have a fright-free night. And remember, it's just another Tuesday. Then he sprinted off into the gloom. I cautiously entered my house and locked the door behind me as dread continued to settle. In my haste to get ready for bed, I stayed blissfully unaware that outside my window loomed an ominous creature. Its canine-like appearance was strikingly similar to the tattoo we'd seen on that mysterious man at Maybe's diner. With that unsettling feeling still lingering, I double-checked all the locks and drew the curtains tightly. The thoughts of that eerie man and the sinister look in his eyes haunted me as I got ready for bed. As I lay in the darkness, my focus shifted to the uncomfortable stillness of my room. I could hear a faint scratching noise from the backyard, which I assumed to be old tree branches swaying in the breeze. However, seeing a hulking figure under the moonlight by my window made me realize it was something more sinister, something monstrous. As I frantically dialed Brett's number for help, my frozen fingers refused to cooperate. Between stuttering breaths, I recounted what transpired and begged him to come over. Brett tried to maintain his composure despite his own fear-filled voice promising to be there as quickly as possible. The gruesome creature outside began attacking our neighbors with a nightmarish voracity, rending limbs and gnashing teeth through flesh. Blood-curdling screams filled the air as the werewolf-like creature proceeded to maul its way through houses with an insatiable urge for destruction. Too terrified to flee, I could only cower inside my room, praying that I wouldn't become its next victim. It wasn't long before I heard Brett's car screeching to a halt outside my house, with him hurriedly running inside. He burst through my bedroom door just as the monstrous creature smashed through the living room window, sending shards of glass exploding throughout the house. It now stood in front of us, a massive dogman dripping with blood, its searing red gaze met ours, and we knew we were trapped. 
Brett yelled at me to call for more help while he tried to distract the dogman using whatever makeshift weapons he could find. Frantically calling Emily from Maybe's diner after dialing 911 provided a faint glimmer of hope for a plan. Emily arrived just in time and showed unexpected bravery as the horrendous creature began to charge towards Brett. She brandished an old family heirloom filled with holy water blessed by her ancestors and hurled it at the dogman, effectively immobilizing it. The beast writhed and reeled in pain, buying us precious moments to escape. As we drove off with adrenaline surging, our thoughts turned to identifying the horrific being we'd encountered. Emily mentioned that the diner was established on sacred land, and its legends included tales of an insidious werewolf known as Othos. Detailed accounts remarking on its red-eyed glare matched our encounter precisely. Though we managed to flee from death's grip that night, we understood that Othos could not be killed by any means we knew. Yet, facing the supernatural horror that resided in our town gave birth to a steely resolve. We would do everything possible to protect those who remained and learn more about the malevolent force behind Otho's reign of terror. In time, survivors gathered and formed a circle of knowledge dedicated to unraveling Otho's mysterious origins and powers. As new faces joined our ranks over the days, brought together by trauma and terror, one unsettling truth made itself evident. Othos was far from finished terrorizing us. It was September 17, 2015. I had just gotten off my shift at the local convenience store in Madison, Wisconsin, and decided to swing by the tavern for a quick drink. I remember cracking a few cheesy jokes at the bartender's expense, something about spilling a beer and calling it alcohol abuse. As the evening wore on, I noticed an odd-looking man standing in the corner. He must have been at least six feet, five inches tall, with broad shoulders, a wild beard, and unkempt hair that fell past his shoulders. I couldn't pinpoint what was so strange about him. Maybe it was the way he stood awkwardly apart from everyone else, or the seemingly animalistic energy that radiated from his presence. Engrossed in conversation with my friends, I barely noticed as the man slipped away into the shadows near the back door of the tavern. An odd chill crept through my spine, but I brushed it off and focused on my drink. Later that night, on my way home after having shared hearty goodbyes with my friends, I stumbled upon a disturbing scene that would haunt me for years to come. A man lay on the sidewalk, his face bloodied and battered beyond recognition. The poor man appeared to have suffered a vicious animal's mauling. I wanted to wretch at the sight of it all but managed to hold back. Instead, I fumbled in my pocket for my phone and dialed 911 to report the grisly discovery. In the weeks following this bizarre encounter, more gruesome attacks were reported around town. A woman was found in her home with deep gashes across her arms and torso. Two kids walking home were assaulted by an elusive and brutal force that left them bruised and shaking. Despite numerous reports, law enforcement couldn't locate any tangible evidence or suspects, but vigilance around town increased dramatically. One dark night, not long after those gruesome events, I was walking back from a friend's place and had just entered an alley to save time. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I perceived something unnatural. Fear gripped me as I saw a figure emerge from an unlit corner, the same tall man from the tavern. He stood motionless as I stared into his eyes, those cold and lifeless eyes that seemed to be fixated on their prey. 
Without warning, he shot towards me with a sudden burst of speed that belied his enormous frame. As he lunged with his arms, there were raised claws where fingers should have been. Duck! Someone shouted just in time. I dropped to the ground and felt a whoosh of air above my head. Out of nowhere came another figure, appearing determined to stop this creature, whoever or whatever it was. As the second person approached, I recognized him as Bill Thompson, the burly truck driver who frequented the tavern. Why in the hell are you here? You've got to scram. He yelled at me while trading blows with my would-be attacker. The colossal man looked less human than before. His face contorted in anger and sheer animalistic furor as he fought with Bill. Otherwise paralyzed with fear, I suddenly remembered that I had a Swiss army knife in my pocket. As Bill held off the creature, I wrestled out my knife and moved quickly behind it. Trembling with fear and adrenaline, I slashed at what seemed like its Achilles tendon. The beastly man screamed in pain before pivoting around and launching itself at Bill before they both crashed into the brick wall of an adjacent building. I rolled out of their path just in time and rose to my feet. Bill managed to hold the creature back despite its inhuman ferocity. I saw its monstrous face which appeared more animal than human, contorted into a snarl of hatred. Blood dripped from its vicious fangs and down its elongated snout. The transformation from man to beast continued rapidly, with patches of fur sprouting on its skin. Kicking a trash can into the creature's path, Bill created a temporary barrier, allowing us to pursue our escape. As we sprinted through the maze of alleys and side streets, Bill led the way. He explained that the creature had been hunting in the area for some time and that attacks had steadily increased in frequency. Though he couldn't identify what it was exactly, he knew it wasn't natural. After taking refuge behind a dumpster, Bill filled me in on his plan to contact an expert who had knowledge about these unimaginable creatures. His connection with this person dated back years, when Bill had encountered another similarly inexplicable entity, a ravenous creature whose existence defied every ounce of logic. Quickly but quietly, we made our way to an old bookstore on the edge of town. Inside was a vast collection of manuscripts containing cryptic information about supernatural beings. The stern-faced proprietor took one look at our blood-soaked clothes and knew what we were after. We frantically searched through volumes detailing all manner of creatures, including vampires, witches, and chimeras, desperate to find something linked to this murderous beast. As I flipped through one book's heavy pages, an illustration suddenly caught my eye. It was strikingly similar to the creature we had encountered. The proprietor leaned over my shoulder and confirmed that our attacker was a werewolf, a curse being steeped in European folklore. However, instead of turning only during full moons, as popularized in stories, our werewolf was an unfortunate soul transformed entirely by an unknown force and controlled by its primal instincts. Why Bill didn't call for help earlier? He couldn't risk subjecting anyone else to the danger or letting the beast slip away. But now, time was of the essence, and we needed help to finally confront what we were dealing with. With no immediate way to stop the creature, let alone remove the curse afflicting it, our only option was to confine it before it could wreak more havoc on innocent lives. The proprietor advised that silver chains might serve as a temporary restraint since they had been effective in past encounters with similar creatures. We left the bookstore with a plan in mind but knew that surviving this ordeal would take more than just knowledge and luck. It was time to rally support outside of just ourselves. 
Bill contacted his expert friend and explained the situation. To our surprise, she already knew about the werewolf and had been monitoring its activities from a distance, waiting for an opportunity to intervene. She agreed to meet us at a specified location, armed with silver chains and other tools for combating supernatural forces. As night began to fall on the fateful day of our confrontation, we gathered together, Bill, myself, and his expert friend, whose name I learned was Amelia, at a warehouse near where previous attacks had taken place. We were ready for what was ahead but could not shake off our nerves. The air inside grew colder, as if we had opened a portal to another dimension. Suddenly, out of the darkness emerged the werewolf, bloodthirsty and determined to end us. Its snarl echoed through the warehouse like a war cry as it charged straight at us. Together, with grim resolve and seamless teamwork, we managed to ensnare the beast with silver chains that burned into its flesh. We bound it repeatedly until it was incapable of moving even an inch without convulsing in pain. Though we had stopped it from attacking further victims, there was no easy resolution or heroic epiphany. We couldn't forgive its gruesome deeds, but we also couldn't ignore the tragedy of the person whose life had been shattered by this cruel fate. As we stood over our restrained enemy, the somber, chilling atmosphere told us that our battle was far from over. The real challenge would be finding a way to end the werewolf's curse altogether before it returned to reclaim its reign of terror and more lives were lost to its relentless hunger. Though victorious for now, we knew that the darkness had only retreated and that it would one day come creeping back. This story is called The Gruesome Discovery on Lockdale Street from Riverdale Enigma. Let's begin. This happened to me on August 28, 1997. For most people, Thursdays were just an ordinary day, but for me and my sister, Jenny, Thursdays meant a night out at our favorite local bar. We always enjoyed letting loose after a draining week at our office jobs. That particular evening, we spent hours laughing and talking with friends. Our nights out had become a welcome piece of normalcy in our otherwise mundane lives. We finally called it a night and headed back to our townhouse on Lockdale Street. The evening air was cool, and the only sound filling the silent streets was the clicking of our heels against the pavement. We felt safe in our quiet neighborhood having lived there for nearly three years without any issues. As we approached home, Jenny noticed something strange hanging from the street lamp right outside our front door. This unexpected sight sent shivers down my neck as we approached cautiously. It seemed to be scraps of torn clothing, blood-stained clothing. The grotesque display forced us to pause, our hearts pounding. There was no way this was a prank. The viscera smeared across some of the fabric pieces made it all too real. What do you think happened here? I asked Jenny in a hushed tone. My sister swallowed hard before responding. I don't know, but we need to call the police. We rushed inside and locked our front door behind us. Trembling hands dialed 911 while I tried to remember if any of our neighbors had been missing recently or if there were any reports of violence in the area that could explain this horrifying decoration left on our doorstep. The police arrived swiftly and took note of the gruesome scene. They promised to investigate further and caution anyone living nearby about potential dangers lurking within our quaint community. Days turned into sleepless nights as we waited for answers. The investigation dragged on, and unpredictable noises outside kept us on edge. Our home, once a sanctuary from daily life, 
now felt like a prison. With each passing day, the tension only grew. One afternoon, after returning from work, Jenny noticed bloody paw prints leading away from our house. They were massive, larger than any dog tracks we'd ever seen before. This discovery sent us spiraling into confusion and fear. That Thursday night, Jenny and I decided to stay in with our friends Nate and Kira instead of venturing out for our usual night at the bar. The laughter and camaraderie helped take our minds off the terrifying mystery that seemed to haunt us at every turn. Suddenly, an ear-splitting crash erupted outside just as darkness blanketed Lockdale Street completely. Panic set in as we froze in fear, not knowing what awful thing might come next. Guys, we can't just sit here, Nate said with determination in his voice as he grabbed a kitchen knife from the knife block. We need to protect ourselves. Moments later, another crash, followed by horrified screams, echoed down the quiet streets. We knew that we had to do something, anything, to protect our friends and neighbors from whatever was terrorizing them. As Jenny called the police again to report the sounds of violence and a possible animal attack nearby, Kira stepped bravely outside, armed with a large frying pan, while Nate stood guard with his knife raised high. As I peered out from behind them in terror, the unsettling sight before us seemed unreal. There were multiple large figures suddenly chasing down panicked residents in the bloody, moonlit street just a few houses away from us. Gripped by instinctual terror, I couldn't help but scream at what looked like monstrous wolf-like creatures pursuing their prey through the quiet neighborhood. Without missing a beat, one of the terrifying creatures veered off its pursuit and charged towards us. Jenny, hearing our screams, hurried back to the door as we held off the advancing beast. The creature's massive size and powerful force had it hurtling towards us at a frightening speed. In a moment that felt like slow motion, I could see the unnaturally sharp claws poised to tear into us. Desperately, we hurled whatever makeshift weapons we had as we prepared for an unimaginable onslaught. Throwing everything at the approaching creature, we managed to slow it down, giving us a chance to retreat into our home. Nate slammed the door shut and locked it as we pushed furniture against it in an attempt to barricade ourselves inside. Kira and Nate decided we needed to arm ourselves with more lethal weapons. They improvised some makeshift spears using kitchen knives and wooden broom handles. We knew that the creature outside could break down our barriers, but we wanted our home to be a fortress until help arrived. The police response was slow, but eventually, they surrounded our neighborhood with squad cars. Their presence bolstered our hope that the nightmare might soon end. The following day, news spread of an individual found torn apart in their own house nearby. The community was on high alert, but the creature had vanished. Its whereabouts were unknown. By the second day, people missing from our neighborhood were found in a grisly scene just beyond town. Pools of blood were examined as gruesome human remains littered the area. Though professionals were searching for clues about these dire events and how to stop them from continuing, Jenny, Kira, Nate and I remained in a heightened state of terror every time the sun went down and wished ardently for this nightmare to end. On the third day following the attack outside of our home, police received information that instead of one single animal or creature causing all the carnage, there were multiple sightings of similar huge beasts miles apart from one another. This new development brought even more fear to all people living within that radius. In the midst of chaos and fright, authorities established a curfew to ensure that no one went outside after dark. We stayed huddled inside our fortified house, hoping that this gruesome ordeal would somehow end soon. 
That night proved to be exceptionally quiet until we noticed a figure lurking near our house through a window crack. The terrifying silhouette gave us reason enough to contact authorities, but they were already stretched thin and promised to send backups when possible. We knew we had to fend for ourselves. As the moon continued to rise, more of those monstrous figures began to emerge from the shadows and surround our home. Realizing that another attack was imminent, we refused to be sitting ducks any longer. Armed with our makeshift weapons, we fought back against the encroaching creatures in a last-ditch effort to survive. From all sides, we clashed with these massive beings in a chaotic display of violence and desperation. For a moment, it seemed as though we were holding them at bay. But their overwhelming numbers and brute force began taking their toll on us. As I took down one werewolf-like monster before me, another raised its claw above my head, ready to strike. I braced for the end, but suddenly Jenny intercepted the beast's attack. The war between man and beast raged on into the night until sirens pierced through the darkness. Reinforcements had finally arrived. With their flashing red and blue lights illuminating our street, they fired upon these otherworldly creatures, who got weak and retreated into the unknown. Though our lives were spared that night when the chaos had finally subsided, authorities redoubled their effort to find answers for these horrifying events. There was no denying that our quiet neighborhood had become infested with something far beyond our understanding, werewolves. This story is called The Grizzly Transformation of Werewolf Ridge, from Unseen Witness. Let's begin. This happened to me in the year 2006, on November 5th. Pedro Gonzalez was my childhood best friend. His most prominent feature was his unique sense of humor, which made us laugh even during the darkest times. Living in Armstrong County, Pennsylvania, We'd often get together at familiar places after work. Our favorite spot was the rural diner off Outlaw Lane. One late evening, Pedro and I sat in a dimly lit corner booth as we slowly sipped our coffees and shared an order of classic buffalo wings. Just then, B, my former neighbor, dropped by our table and whispered nervously if we heard about the dismembered horse found near Werewolf Ridge last week. The quiet town was abuzz with rumors of how this bizarre incident occurred right after the full moon. We didn't think much about it at that time, and after finishing our snack, we bid be goodbye. As Pedro and I exited the diner, we saw a group of people clustered around an old pickup truck. Its driver held up a piece of torn clothing splattered with blood. The crowd murmured in concern. Pedro couldn't resist cracking a joke. Hey, everybody! At least it wasn't another horse! Some people chuckled nervously under their breaths, while others shot us judgmental glares. I glanced at Pedro and decided we ought to head home and continue our conversation over a game of pool in my basement. Upon reaching my house, Pedro briefly excused himself to use the bathroom. I grabbed a few beers from the fridge and set up the billiards table. The game had barely started when the phone rang. It was my Aunt Adela calling from her summer cottage next to Werewolf Ridge. She sounded hysterical as she gasped about strange noises near her property. We assured her that it was probably just some coyotes on the hunt and that she had nothing to worry about. As I hung up the phone, Pedro suddenly looked pale and troubled, mentioning that he left his keys at the diner. Feeling responsible for his absent-mindedness, I agreed to accompany him back to the diner to retrieve them. We got into my car, a battered 96 Toyota Corolla, and drove toward the diner. 
The night was eerily calm as we traversed the darkened country roads. Suddenly, the car jolted violently, like it had struck something huge. I slammed on the brakes and quickly climbed out of the car to assess the damage. Through the thick fog that enveloped us, we could barely make out an enormous shape lying in front of my car, a humanoid creature with elongated limbs, covered in coarse hair, and bloody from head to toe. As Pete dialed 911 with trembling fingers, I used my phone's flashlight to illuminate this gruesome sight. It was when I noticed several bloody footprints leading away from where this thing lay that whatever had attacked this creature could be lurking close nearby. The dispatcher asked us to stay calm and wait for local authorities to reach our location as quickly as possible. But in that bone-chilling darkness of uncertainty, every minute seemed like an eternity. I felt like we were being watched by hidden eyes lurking amidst the shadows as shudders ran through me, not knowing what horror would come next. That's when we heard it, an agonizing howl from deep within Werewolf Ridge. The spine-chilling sound echoed ominously throughout the countryside, sending us into a state of uncontrollable fear. As Pedro and I waited in the suffocating darkness, I noticed a trail of the same bloody footprints we discovered earlier lining the roadside. Fearful that whoever or whatever had caused the mutilation of the humanoid creature might be nearby, we hesitantly decided to follow the trail. We walked further along the road in silence, our hearts pounding and our hands shaking. The fog grew thicker and more disorienting with every step. As we turned onto a dirt path, we stumbled upon a grisly scene. There, at the edge of a seemingly tranquil pond, we discovered yet another victim. The pale, lifeless body of a man lay among the scattered evidence of what looked like a violent struggle. His face was frozen in terror as his limbs were savagely torn from his torso. It was clear to us that staying there would only expose us to more danger, so we quickly retreated to my car, our minds racing with questions about what happened and who or what could commit such horrendous acts. We decided that there was no time to wait for the police to arrive, and Adela could be in peril. As we neared her cottage, Pete suggested that whatever attacked these victims might still be lurking around her property. I agreed but couldn't think of another plan other than finding her and getting to safety immediately. As I pulled up to Aunt Adela's cottage, we saw her standing at her front door, frantically waving us inside. We rushed in after exchanging worried glances and locking the door behind us. Once safe inside, we revealed to Aunt Adela the horrors we had encountered along our way there. Though she expressed immense relief that we were unharmed, she confirmed that strange sounds and cries had continued throughout the night. We knew it wasn't safe for us or anyone else to stay close to Werewolf Ridge alone with this unknown threat continuing its heinous acts. Our only option was to leave that very night, despite the lingering fear strangling us like choking vines of dread. Only hours after leaving Adela's cottage, we received a phone call from the local authorities. They informed us about multiple savagely mutilated bodies found near Werewolf Ridge and its surroundings. A chill ran through our veins. We realized how perilously close we were to suffering a similar fate. Haunted by our experience but grateful for our own safety, we could not help but wonder what kind of monster could carry out such gruesome attacks on humans with relentless determination and brutal efficiency. Months passed as the memories gradually lost their potency in our minds. Until one evening, when I stumbled upon an obscure article in an old local newspaper. It recounted a puzzling folktale about feral wolf-like creatures that tormented the people of Armstrong County generations ago. The story described coincidental similarities between the cruel deaths back then 
and the recent horrors we witnessed. Though I couldn't shake off this disturbing realization, any questions or speculations were silenced by Pedro's stern reminder that it was best not to delve deeper into these sinister occurrences. From that day on, we avoided discussing the nightmarish events near Werewolf Ridge. But every time an eerie full moon illuminates the sky, casting long shadows over Armstrong County, I can't help but remember what we saw that ill-fated night. And in my darkest moments, the possibility lingers in my mind. There may still be werewolves among us. This story is called Tales of Deceit, from just another ordinary day. Let's begin. This happened to me on March 29th. I live in a small, sleepy town called Willowbrook, Illinois. Nothing much ever happens here, or so I thought. It all started when I was walking home from my late shift at the local diner. As I strolled down the dimly lit street, I noticed something peculiar near a neighbor's house, a trail of blood leading to their backyard. Already feeling uneasy, I quickly made my way back to the safety of my home. The next morning, as we exchanged our usual morning greetings over coffee, our neighbor, Isabel Darnell, mentioned something that sent shivers up my spine. Her dog had been acting out of control last night, barking and howling like mad. It got so bad that she called animal control to have them come check it out the next day. She joked about there being some mysterious creature in town causing all of this commotion. Little did she know. As the days passed, more and more peculiar incidents popped up around Willowbrook. Things like shredded window screens, deep gashes in wooden fences, and destroyed gardens made it clear that something was very wrong. The townspeople began gossiping wildly about what monstrosity could be responsible for these gruesome occurrences. One day after work, my best friend Fred Garvey approached me with a wild theory. Our quiet town was under attack by none other than a werewolf. Have you noticed, he pointed out, that these incidents coincided with a full moon? I should have dismissed it instantly as just another far-fetched conspiracy rumor in our gossipy town, but a part of me couldn't help connecting the unsettling dots. Several weeks later, during another full moon period, Fred and I spotted a werewolf-like figure in the distance, tearing into the carcass of a cat in an alleyway. It was the most horrifying sight I had ever witnessed. We sprinted home each of us mumbling their jumbled thoughts and fears, discussing how to protect ourselves from this monster that everyone thought didn't exist. We concluded that perhaps we could construct sturdy metal window bars for our homes, though it seemed to be a tedious task we couldn't afford to delay. Over the following weeks, strange things continued to occur sporadically throughout Willowbrook. As if terror had taken root in our community, a constant state of fear lingered among the populace. Many townspeople began arming themselves with weapons, installing security systems, and taking any other precaution necessary in an attempt to fight back against these disturbing events. Despite their efforts, however, no suspects were ever apprehended or charged. One night after work, as I headed back home, Another pulse-pounding incident unfolded right before my eyes. A group of friends walking on the street across from me noticed something around the same time as I did. It was unmistakable, a werewolf-like figure barely visible in the shadows who was watching us with bloodthirsty eyes. The group scattered instantly as the creature lunged at one of them relentlessly. My heart pounding out of my chest... I sprinted around a corner, desperate not to end up at its mercy as well. As I continued my frantic escape, 
hiding behind parked cars and trash cans, making my moves erratic and unpredictable. One thought haunted me. What if that thing came after me next? The overwhelming dread building inside made every step heavier than the last, but there was no time to stop. All I could do was pray it wouldn't find me as I tried my best to make it back home alive. Fred convinced me that we needed to warn the authorities, despite the risk of sounding like lunatics. We decided to approach the local police station in person, wanting to ensure our message would be taken seriously. Once at the station, it took a long time for us to persuade them not to dismiss our claims outright. Eventually, they agreed to send patrols around the town on full moon nights in order to monitor any suspicious activity. We also spread the word among our friends and neighbors, alerting them about the prowling werewolf. Some were skeptical, others believed us, but all took precautions nonetheless. Fred installed security cameras around his house. I did the same at mine. In addition to this, my parents and siblings barricaded our entrance doors and kept weapons within easy reach during full moon nights. Nobody ventured outside on those nights, even if their lives depended on it. The dreaded moment arrived. The full moon had cast her glow upon Willowbrook once more. I somberly watched as my little brother set up metal barricades across his bedroom window. I sat on a chair in my room with a nail-studded baseball bat close at hand when suddenly a heart-wrenching, high-pitched scream pierced through the night air. Moments later, another dreadful scream tore through me. I recognized it as the voice of Mrs. Avery, Fred's mother. I couldn't comprehend my next move. The desire to help my friends fought a fierce battle with the need for self-preservation within my own mind. I frantically dialed Fred's number, which rang out. No answer. Phone clenched tightly in hand, I froze upon hearing something heavy land with a thud on my roof. My heart raced faster than ever before, and sweat streamed down my face as I heard steps getting closer. All of a sudden, there was silence, and then came pounding against my door, so strong that I felt certain it would cave in at any moment. I couldn't bring myself to move. My body was paralyzed by fear. If I called the police now, they would arrive too late to save me. I needed to focus on my own defense. Even if I were to climb out of a window and run, there was no guarantee that this creature wouldn't catch me. Just when I believed the end had found me, the pounding ceased, and I heard the distant wailing of sirens. Footsteps receded from my door, and a low, gut-wrenching growl echoed throughout my home as the creature retreated from discovery. I remained motionless until the sounds of police officers searching the area reached my ears. That's when I broke down completely, overwhelmed by relief and adrenaline exhaustion. Later on, once I'd pulled myself together, one officer informed me that they'd found Mrs. Avery injured in her home, barely alive. The beast hadn't killed her but seemed to be marking its territory. Over time, we were shocked to uncover numerous other townsfolk who'd had close encounters with this monstrous werewolf-like creature and lived to tell the tale. In retrospect, it all made sense now. The missing pet posters that had adorned walls around town were likely victims of this predator too. As life in Willowbrook adjusted to this grim reality, Fred, his mother, and I started working on a detailed report hoping to enlist assistance from experts in cryptozoology. It was while researching historical reports of similar incidents that we found what we believed to be our answer. Back in 1947, a werewolf story had also surfaced in Willowbrook, a story different from all others because it bore striking resemblance to our current ordeal. This dark truth hanging over our heads now bounds us together. 
Willowbrook's townsfolk drove together in fear of the werewolf that haunted our lives on full moon nights. This story is called Whispers of the Silent Stalker, from Unraveled Legends 81. Let's begin. This happened to me on October 29th, 1987. My life was as ordinary as anyone else's until that horrifying night. My name is Trent Edwards, a mechanic by profession and a trusted friend by choice. Working at the same garage for years, I knew everyone in town, including the local sheriff, good old Johnny Thompson. That evening, I closed up shop and decided to grab a few beers with my buddies at the corner tavern. Laughter filled the air as we joked around and shared old stories. As we downed another round of drinks, my wife, Kathy, rang my phone. She needed me home right away. I arrived home to find Kathy distraught and shaking like a leaf. Our neighbor, Karen Adams, had been viciously attacked in her own home, her bloody clothes flung everywhere. The only clue left behind was the filthy paw print of an unknown animal on the kitchen counter. The weeks that followed were tense and filled with hushed conversations about Karen's strange ordeal. Nobody knew who or what had caused her gruesome injuries, but one thing was certain. There was something evil lurking in our town. Late one night after work, my friends and I gathered in our usual spot at the tavern to blow off steam. We joked sarcastically about all the elaborate werewolf theories spreading like wildfire in town. Little did we know, those theories were about to hit too close to home. We heard it before we saw it, blood-chilling screeching echoing through the crisp autumn air outside. A new kind of terror gripped us as we exchanged wide-eyed glances and dashed to lock up all entry points to the tavern. From outside came sounds of whimpering agony mixed with overwhelming fear, noises that will forever haunt my nightmares. Huddled inside with our friends near tears, we knew that something unspeakable was happening just beyond the walls we were hiding behind. Suddenly, there was a deafening silence. We stared at each other, too terrified to make a sound, too afraid of what might be lurking outside. The tavern doors creaked open ominously as Johnny, the trusty sheriff, cautiously stepped in, shaking and disheveled. It's Terry! Johnny choked out between panting breaths. He's gone! Torn apart like like one of those horror flick scenes. The room froze in fear and disbelief. Terry, one of our own, had become another victim of the unknown menace plaguing our town. Days dragged on as we tried to pick up the shattered pieces of our once safe and unassuming lives. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we'd lock our doors and pray for dawn to break. Yet no further attacks occurred. However, peace would not last. November's full moon brought a new wave of terror that rained upon us like nails ripping through flesh. As I entered Johnny's house to discuss the ongoing investigation of the recent attacks, I found him outside, staring blankly into the woods behind his property. What is it? I whispered urgently growing anxious at his unresponsive gaze into the darkness. Suddenly, his voice shuddered out a single sinister word. Tracks. Human-sized paw prints led deeper into trees heavy with moonlit shadows. The horrifying implication punched into my gut like a fistful of jagged shards. Our attacker wasn't just evil. It was intelligent calculating its next move even as fear silently devoured us from within. We stayed awake until daybreak filled every corner of Johnny's living room with muted daylight, dreading what nightfall may bring. 
The sun eventually set once again against our protests, but with an eerie calmness that settled upon us like thick fog. We hunkered down and waited, waiting for the familiar screeches and howls of a night ruled by terror. When they finally came, chilling us to the bone and clawing the last remnants of hope from our desperate hearts, with them comes the awareness that any of us could be next. Inches from understanding the truth about our unseen attacker, we knew our once idyllic town had transformed into something straight out of a twisted nightmare. As the horrifying shrieks grew closer, we prayed in silent unity for some way to put an end to this living hell. We decided to contact our town's officials to see if our town had any plans to deal with this mysterious creature but they offered nothing but empty promises and told us that they would look into it. I found their unwillingness to act as evidence that they either knew more than they were willing to admit, or that they were just as scared as we were. We resolved to band together for safety and support, hoping that there was strength in numbers. That night, several of us gathered at Johnny's house, vigilant and ready for whatever might come. As night fell and the fear continued to grow, we tried to make small talk, attempting to keep our minds off of what might befall us. Our eyes darted across the windows, scanning the dark woods outside. Suddenly, something crashed against the back door of Johnny's house. We all jumped up from where we were sitting and armed ourselves with whatever we could find, knives from the kitchen drawers, a baseball bat Johnny kept stored away in a closet. Another crash sounded outside, followed by agonized screams. In a split-second decision, I called 911, quickly explaining the horrifying situation taking place outside our safe haven. Help is on its way, the operator assured us. We waited with bated breath as the disturbing noises escalated into unchecked chaos just outside our walls. It felt like hours before we heard distant sirens approaching. The monstrous howling outside transformed into angered frustration before softly receding into whimpers as our attacker retreated further into the woods. When the police finally arrived, what they found outside was all too familiar bloody remains that once belonged to a human being. Panic spread among us like wildfire. If even a police presence couldn't prevent an attack, what hope did any of us have? With heavy hearts, those remaining alive vowed never again to leave one another's side. We stayed together every night, keeping a round-the-clock watch, bolting windows, and locking doors as our only hope against the unseen terror that had invaded our lives. During our long, sleepless hours of guarding our sanctuary, we began to piece together, with the help of Old Town folklore, the possible identity of our attacker. One terrifying theory began to gain dominance, that a man or woman in our community was cursed, transforming into a bloodthirsty beast during each full moon. Fear turned to paranoia as we scrutinized every person who crossed our paths. But as the days wore on, no one showed clear signs of being the creature, leaving us confused and desperate for answers. On the last night before another dreaded full moon, we decided to take matters into our own hands. An idea took form. We would trap the creature when it entered Johnny's house once more. We stocked up on silver bullets and loaded firearms. The plan was to surprise the creature by appearing at the right moment and sending it back from whence it came. We even chained ourselves in pairs so that if one of us turned out to be the monster, they could be incapacitated before causing harm. The full moon rose high in the sky and as expected, the gut-wrenching howls filled the air. Our hearts raced with anticipation as we waited for hell itself to breach our fragile defenses. But when night gave way to morning light, the bloodshed we anticipated did not come to pass. 
Our ambush lay dormant and ineffective amid a tense silence. Our hope began to fade that an end would ever come. Instead, a deep-seated dread took root in us all. Perhaps we weren't just besieged by one werewolf but by many, a pack hunting us relentlessly until every last soul was snuffed out. How wrong we were about everything, that this small-town nightmare could ever be escaped, that silver bullets or locked doors could keep an ancient evil at bay, or that something so unconscionable, so unspeakable, could not possibly exist within our very midst. And as the sun dipped into the horizon once again, we were left with nothing but a cold and unyielding sorrow, knowing some werewolves walked among us, or perhaps many.